Welcome to Game Stack Live. We're all gamers. Oh my gosh, I can't <laughs> wait for this to come out. We've created Game Stack Live to help level up your game development. That's the experience we always want people to have, right? You know, the experience of walking out of the tavern and seeing your ship in front of you. I don't have a pirate name. What's your pirate name? I don't know, but I want one. Nothing about us without us. The most important thing is that you listen to the community. You design for one, you solve for many. I don't have Twitter, but you can email me. You guys got jackets? Oh, I did. I didn't get a jacket. Malik just said he didn't get a jacket. <laughs> The future of gaming with the Xbox Series X, the 12 teraflop beast. Day one is a wrap. We can't wait to see what you will create. Welcome to day two of GameStack Live, a special event for you, the developers, to learn more about what Microsoft GameStack solutions can do to enhance your build, engage your players, and ultimately empower you and your team to create great things. That is right, Malik. But of course, this event isn't just the live show. In fact, over on our YouTube channel, we've got a fresh, hot batch of tech talks, demos, and a whole host of deep dives designed to get you fully up to speed on the latest from GameStack. And remember, we want to hear from you. It was a party in our Discord yesterday with questions for our tech experts and insights into panel discussions. So jump in and join us. The water is great, I promise. Today is the day to give us your impressions, your thoughts, your questions. Remember, we've got a host of tech specialists ready to answer. It's absolutely right, Malik. In fact, we had a great question posed yesterday by Mr. Andy Puppy, and they asked, what game development technology has changed the game in the last five years? And what studios do you think are at the forefront of game development? Who's pushing the edge? Now on Discord, a user responded, and that's Scipio. To the first question, Unreal Engine. Epic Games is constantly investing and inspiring in the indie community. In the last five years, Unreal has changed so much. That's absolutely right, they have. Where else can you get AAA tools and education for free? for puny and significant peons like me. Not wow. like you, wow. like me, who are striving to learn. Look, if you're striving to learn and break into the industry, you're not insignificant. Now, in response to the second question, Scipio said, Sony and Media Molecule are really pushing the limits and breaking conventions with their Dreams game service. You checked out Dreams? I've oh, seen yes. Dreams is legit. Creations. I played it a bit, I played so it cool. a bit. Now, it was made exclusively for the PS4. The art, the audio, and programming possibilities are endless, and they truly unlock the potential for gamers to learn development and team collaboration in a fun, engaging, and social environment. That's absolutely true. So without having access to PC hardware. Love that game, by the way. Now, this is just a taste of the chat happening over on our Discord, so again, Come join the conversation. And we'll have a lot to talk about, starting with a look at how InXile used creative iteration to drive Wastelands 3 development. Then we're going to be jumping into the world of online services with a panel discussion around the opportunities in today's gaming industry. Today is also the day that we talk about the next chapter in gaming. That is right, the Xbox, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, sorry. We heard it already. The Xbox Series X and Ooh. Project X Cloud. We're going to be talking about that today. We've got a stellar, stellar panel here to break down what you can expect from this console right here. Stellar panel, but um, uh, I had a selfie session earlier. I'm just I was going to say, that I think I'm going to, I think, I'm we can't to, go over there. I'm going to, I think I'm going to try. You're Wait, really going to try? Sure. I'm going to try. Oh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to stay I'm gonna, well away from you. I'm going to. Malik, if you touch that, we're fighting. You know what? I think Master Chief is. I think. I think he's gonna. He's gonna tear me apart. We'll leave that. So there. Gonna, yeah, I'm gonna leave it. But look at that box. Um, so here's the thing. When we first, when it was first unveiled, it looked like a PC tower, and certainly has the same shape. But that thing is. It's actually really small for the amount of power in there. 12 teraflops Ooh. of amazing power. I am. Uh, I'm blown away. I'm excited. I cannot wait for holiday 2020, uh, and of course Halo Infinite uh, with that guy over there, Master Chief, of course. Who is I still guarding? Don't believe, I don't believe that guy's over there. I'm just gonna throw that out there. You're just gonna believe. You don't believe he's no, there. he's not there. You're just going to... Didn't see him at all. Disavow his... Yep, disavow. Disavow. Anyway, I'm very excited for... Spartans don't um, die. They're missing in action. Oh, look at that. Yeah, that's, yeah. I know my lore. Oh, I know beautiful. my lore. Um, but anyway, yeah, the next generation gaming, uh, all about speed, power, and of course, compatibility. Mm -hmm. I remember that from yesterday. Um, those are the notes. And um, you can go in on news.xbox.com and see the whole write-up, as well as Digital Foundry, who did a great piece on it yesterday. Again, this console's 
It is a beast. It is Absolutely. an absolute beast. It truly is. But Malik, that is not all. A look into what drives the ever eclectic double fine universe we get to look at today. And we're also sitting down with the coalition to talk Gears Tactics and their experience optimizing for PC. Yesterday was just jam packed. And if you missed a session, never fear, because they'll be available on our YouTube playlist soon. You can also check out our Mixer channel to watch our past streams. But before you check out those VODs, I think you're going to want to see this. Take a look behind the scenes of a game in development with Exile. I think strategy games make you feel smart, I think, above everything else. They make you feel clever. I also like that sense of being like a mastermind. I thought through every possible outcome. If I take that debuff and I put it on him, it combos with his ability. I can proc this passive that will combo on this. And you build all these like layers upon layers and then feel like a genius or a fool depending on how it plays out. I mean, part of it, I think, is heritage. It goes back to miniatures. You know, it goes back to play-by-mail games. I mean, they're the really early parts of what made the game's business. Really, it's about using your brain to make tactical decisions and sort of out-clevering the designer or whatever the situation is. And that same payoff of fun for you using your brain and thinking has continued to be entertaining. I think one of the, the main things about turn-based tactical games that have helped them to flourish and, and last long over the years as a genre is that they put player choice front and center. They give players interesting situations, interesting tools, and the time necessary for players to think through and decide the proper course of action. You can't play another game that has that time pressure and still feel like at the end, I got to think through all the possibilities. I'm the genius. I thought through every way this could work out and then it, and it went exactly as I, as I wanted it to. It serves a need that no other game can fulfill. I have vivid memories of playing Wasteland 1 on my Apple II. Very fond memories that I still have my box set at home, my original one. And for Wasteland 2, I was a backer before I joined In Exile. This type of game is something I love. This franchise is something that I care deeply about. For me, joining Wasteland 3, the, the important thing is that I really wanted to deliver on player expectations. I think if you distill it down, uh, what people love about Wasteland is its tone, its mood, uh, they love the choices and they love the, the reactivity and the way that the world really reflects what you do as a player. And delivering on those core elements of Wasteland is, is something which uh, I, I try to focus as many of my decisions around as possible. Game design is about friction. There's always friction. So there's the, how much code are we gonna reuse from the last one versus create new code? Even getting the same features to work and then adding on other features is generally ends up being pretty much of a rework. In many cases, it felt like we were making routines do exactly what they had done before, right? But they needed a little bit of a twist. To get those better visuals, we needed to do things a different way. They needed to maybe have a, a, perhaps a different memory footprint or a different way that they were streamed in. Everything's all tied to each other, and so you can never make all your decisions in a, in, in a vacuum. It's sort of everything affects everything. So development's hard. When you're building any series, it's really about, like, you look at the previous game and you say what works and what didn't, and that second part's really important. Just because your previous game was successful doesn't mean that there wasn't, like, a superfluous, like, why did we let you customize your pet? You know, did that really make the game more fun? Why did we have 75 kinds of shoes? Do you even need a shoe slot? Because as you add new features, you also need to, I think, consolidate and condense and potentially lose features that weren't adding value. It's kind of like it's a sauce. You like reduce it down to its finest elements and then all that extra water that you didn't eat just kind of evaporates off and then you get like this, and that's when you get something really like uh, dense and tasty. So in Wasteland 2, you had your party of six or more if you had followers, and you could have a party of ten that you came on to. And it would just ping pong 
back and forth as this person moved, then that person moved, then this person moved, then that person moved. My medic's over here, my sniper's over here. I would like them to move together, heal, and then I want my sniper to move back and then take a shot. What seems like a pretty basic thing takes, you know, one, two, three turns to pull off, and it's protracted over, you know, a minute and a half. So it doesn't feel punchy, and it also doesn't respect your choices as much. Whenever turn-based games put too much emphasis on the AI's turn, it makes your mind wander and draws players out of the experience. We really wanted to make sure that the enemies were moving efficiently, and then we get the game back as fast as possible to your turn as a player. Wasteland 3 is definitely punchier and more responsive than it's ever been. We've gone to a, uh, a turn-based system where it's the player's turn and he can move all of his rangers in whichever way he wants to. And that is to allow for more intricate tactics between multiple characters. I'm gonna have this guy shoot that sniper and then throw a smoke grenade. Then I'm gonna have this guy run into the smoke grenade and then start setting up turrets. And that can all happen in the span of a couple of seconds. I think it steers towards trying to make you feel clever and having that moment where all your choices really paid off in a big way. The most critical thing with game making is you got to get to the iteration part as soon as possible. That's all that matters. Definitely in Exile, we put a lot of emphasis on iteration and finding the fun as early as humanly possible. And to that end, we definitely try to not over-design on paper. You really have to fight that urge and get people just worrying about the user experience. That's a challenge. That is a really big challenge. We're working on a particular level or a particular asset, and we spend all of this time honing that particular aspect of the game. And what often gets lost, if you're not careful, is the player's experience. So we are hungry for information, for data, for insights, for anything that we can get our hands on that helps us understand how players play this game. Recently, we've taken onto a process where I've been playtesting, and then kind of like a YouTube streamer, I record my playtests. So basically, I could be like, hey, check out my stream, and then the, the designer who owned that level just watched me play. I'm talking out loud, oh, that was really funny. Oh my God, this is so frustrating. Like, why is it working that way? Or like, holy crap, plus 70% evasion? That's nonsense, we gotta tamp that down. You are trying to have fun with this game, so you wanna be having fun while you play test, and then you wanna be super vigilant of those moments where that fun gets sucked out of the room for whatever reason that is. The more time we get to iterate, the better the product's gonna be. It's always the case. We play for four or five hours every day, and I'm going through the game sentence by sentence, combat by combat, and questioning every single thing that goes on, every visual effect. When do songs kick on? Does that combat feel right? Is that too hard? Did I work too hard to get a piece of loot that is not that great? That's really gonna make me upset, right? And so you have to take in the totality of the experience and say, how is it making me feel? And then you've gotta go through and make all those changes and then do it again. It's, it's not like we were building a new genre and we weren't sure if the genre would work. We're not making Katamari Damacy, you know what I mean? We were building a turn-based strategy game and we know the genre really well, so we know that can be fun, it's just a matter of execution. You know, if you think about it, but the length of these games, so this game's maybe 50 or 60 hours. What is that, every Star Wars film ever made end to end? There's more information than any one human could know inside of these products. So you gotta wrangle this big beast and make sure it comes in tight. We build big games and we build complicated games and we could make our lives a heck of a lot easier if we would just narrow the scope of what we would do or, or make different decisions along the way. But we love these games and, and our fans love these games. Interacting with the community and interacting with the fans through builds that we give out to them or through forums where we get input from backers, that has helped us distill down what we want to preserve and protect and is non-negotiable about the franchise and then also look forward to the areas where we think we can really innovate more. Wow, 
what an incredible journey. And here to talk more about it, please welcome Tim Campbell and David Rogers. Gentlemen, gentlemen, welcome. How's it going? Hello, how are you? I am doing very well. How are you? Do, doing, doing killer, good. yeah. Yeah, uh, obviously now, as you can see, everyone, real quick, we're practicing social distancing today with our interviews on Microsoft Teams. Um, so thanks again for, for being a part of that. And, and we're gonna be doing it a little bit differently, but it's live, you know? I heard some comments I was yesterday. I built People, for this. You are built for it, perfect, I'm <laughs> super excited. Now let's kick things off. Um, actually, before we even get started into the questioning, tell us about who you are and what you do at In Exile. So I'll start off. Uh, my name is Tim Campbell. I'm the game director on Wasteland 3, and uh, I just help wrangle the project, everything about it, the moving pieces to make sure that it's on track and it's turning out to be as, as great of a game as possible. And a lot of times that involves just working with the different development team members, making sure they have what they need, making sure that there's no nothing blocking them or obstacles in their way, and just making sure that everything is running smoothly. Awesome. Yeah, uh, and I'm David Rogers. I'm the lead designer. Um, I work with like our lead systems designer and our lead content designer and our writers to really make sure every element of the game comes together in something that is fun. Like you know, I'm the kind of in charge of the game actually being fun. And so I'm one of the few people on the team that does what most people think game developers do, which is just play the game a ton and yeah. then complain. Uh, and so I'm in that really enviable <laughs> position. That's awesome. <laughs> Two very important uh, roles on the team. And it's funny because uh, you mentioned it just there. Uh, people think that all you do at game at game teams is just play games, which is somewhat true, I guess. Uh, and I love the, the fun fact they're making sure that's in there. So we're going to get into all that because I thought, again, that piece was super awesome. But I want to start off with the storytelling. Um, what do you all think about you know your development story that we kind of just saw in Save Game? Tell us a bit about that. I thought it was fantastic. I, I love that you guys uh, put it front and center on iteration. That is at the core of everything we do at NXL. With games that are as big and interconnected and sprawling as we make them, uh, we have to be playing them constantly, and we have to be iterating as fast as humanly possible. And, and Brian touched on it in the video. Iteration is everything. Uh, if you look at the, the game quality, uh, what players actually play and what they experience, um, everything that they're going to come away and love is from iteration. It's due to us being able to play and test and refine and just home in on the fun as quickly and as consistently as we can. Yeah. And so, David, I, I would love to dial in on that a bit um, as far as the iter iterative process. You know, what is it about it, appeal that it about it that appeals to you so much? Like when you are iterating on a thing, what are some of the things that you're looking for? Well, I, I don't know that it appeals to much to us as much as it's the only way to arrive at something that is like truly fun and polished. Um, and I think it's that's doubly true for big sprawling RPGs like ours, where like as opposed to uh, making Street Fighter, for instance, which is a beautiful game, that's a purely systems driven game. You don't have to worry about oh crap, how much money is the player earning each time they you know beat Vega, and then what kind of gear are they buying, and how does that influence their power, and then what's the power curve across all the fights? Like there's a whole other side of this that that means that I can't. Like we, it's impossible to test a level in isolation. We can't just hop into a level, load a default party, and then and then play. Because if somebody changed the cash reward of a previous quest, that changes what gear I have. That changes my power level. Everything is so wildly interconnected that the. I mean, I would love to hear a better way to go about it. But the only way to really make this game fun is to just play it over and over and over again, and like play it from the start you know, play 20 hours, make a big list of changes, fix them, and then start over from the beginning and then play 25 hours and then start over and then play 30 hours. And you're kind of like crawling through this game, just trying to make everything as balanced. And, you know, the game is, people say 50 or 60 hours. God, I hope it's that low. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm, I'm, so it I'm, certainly I'm, feels huge. I'm wondering though, um, so this is an interesting question maybe for both of you, but especially for David, with that, you know, iter iterative process and you're playing the game over and over again, how do you prevent yourself from sort of, like, how do you have a fresh perspective? How do you know that you're not getting into a spot where uh, maybe your, your opinion is, is fogging up the development? That's a really good question. <laughs> um. I don't know if there's like a good solution other than it's just kind of something that you learn. It's like you kind of can force yourself, like force selective amnesia on yourself, mm -hmm. or it's you kind of understand the the tiers of strategy. I I use like Witcher is a really good example that I think everyone kind of, I, it's really popular. So it's a good example to go off of as opposed to referencing Wasteland 3. Um, in the Witcher, for instance, there is the standard combat system, but then there's the crafting and like uh, and like magical like potions element. 
Um, and that is that's required to play that at a higher level difficulty. So you can kind of understand like, OK, I'm starting to use ability combos right now. And I know and on normal mode for a standard player, they probably wouldn't be using that. So I have to pull back. And so like by kind of diagramming the complexity of your game and understanding like the tiers of strategy that someone might engage in, you can kind of purposefully shut those off in your brain or like actively say like, I'm not going to use these this strategy tier or during this playthrough because I'm trying to test it for this user set. Um, but you have to have a really deep knowledge of your game and your systems to kind of know how to diagram that, how to break that down and kind of what strategies you have to extract from your own play style in order to simulate that kind of player. Yeah, I yeah love this is a trap that it's it's very easy for us to fall into as developers because we're working so long on one feature or one level or one fight <laughs> That we can just kind of get numb to it, right? And we can mm -hmm. may maybe make it work as we expect it to with all of the context that we have in our minds that players might not have. And then if we just put that in front of players, they wouldn't necessarily understand it or they might have friction and get hung up or confused by things. And so we have lots of different steps that we take to try to fight against that. We have regular play tests where we kind of have some people, including Brian, head of the studio, step back and just play through the game like a player, right? And just make funky parties and make funky choices and just test out the game for fun, right? As opposed to testing it for raw functionality. And we also do things where our level designers or, or other people on the team might do peer reviews where a designer who's spent a lot of time working on one level may swap that level to another designer and then they kind of can look at each other's and provide fresh eyes and fresh insight. And so this is the sort of thing that every single day we're trying to fight against so we don't just get numb to you know the, the things that that we're trying to polish out of the game yeah super yeah. important thing and again this uh, whole show is about creating an uh you know optimization for developers and so i think that knowledge is great to share uh I'm, so tim from you uh, as game director how do you, outside of the iteration process, how do you really optimize the game development? Because, you know, you have things like dates that you may have to hit. You have, uh, you know, features that you have to get for review. How do you really go about making sure that everything's moving along? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I mean, a lot of it is is the iteration, but there are different things which feed into the iterative cycle, right? Um, sometimes we get data. Sometimes we get information from whether it's support departments, QA, or, or backers playing an alpha or whatever. And those comments and those bugs and all that feedback kind of funnels back into the development team. And then we kind of sift through it all and assess what things are actionable, what things are not. And then we'll prioritize things and then, and then move them into the development queue for the team to work on. And so on one hand, we're working against our own instincts and our own plan internally and iterating against that. But then we have this funnel of just additional information that's coming through. It might be from people you know, elsewhere in the dev team who aren't on our project but are playing the game with, with clear eyes, or it might be coming in from data from, from backers or elsewhere. But it all comes in and directly affects how we build the game. Okay. That's yeah, there's a there's a couple of really good sources of um uh, of that feedback that have that we've been utilizing. So one is like at this time in particular, we recently just released uh, our beta, uh, and then a little while back we released a, an alpha build. It went to Gamescom. It went to our backers. And so whenever those things go out, like we're glued to Mixer, we're glued to YouTube. We are watching streamers just play through. It. And I love how streamers play because they're trying to entertain the audience. But to do that, they are just like taking their inner monologue and they're just blurting it out. And so every little yeah, annoyance, totally. oh, that sucked. I can't believe that. I had a 95% hit chance. Why did that not work? Or like every little thing that bugs them, they blurt out really loudly, you know, ah. Um, and, then, and then furthermore, uh, what's been really useful for super detailed, super actionable feedback has been the Microsoft Usability Lab. We will take, we took our gamepad, for instance, we did a first pass iteration on GamePad. Okay, we think this is pretty good. We know there's some jank in there, but like the uh, general ideas are there. And then they throw it to, you know, sometimes they throw it to six experts um, or they'll throw it to a cup or they'll bring in like layman's from off the street who just, you know, they just signed up because they like video games. And I can watch them as they're pressing button inputs on the GamePad and I can see those lights up. Like if they're having an issue with like, oh, they can't access this menu, I can actually see what they're pressing. And they have like PhD, PhD research experts there really parsing out like not just like what are they doing, but like how do I ask questions to them in a way that won't guide them or prime them so we can really get like the purest form of their experience out. And those end up being super, super actionable. I love working with the usability lab. Yeah, that's been super helpful for development. I mean, it's been invaluable. 
Uh, of course, the developer in us like always cringes when we see a you know a streamer uh, you know hitting a bug or or getting we get kind of we have to put something that's that's maybe still partially raw in front of the usability lab. Uh, but every time we do this, we just get real world feedback coming in from players that is super invaluable because they're coming at this from a different perspective. And we really want our game to be playable by a right, wide range of players, not just people who are hardcore or people who are tuned into the franchise previously. And we really want to open this up. And so being able to get those fresh perspectives really influences a lot of what we do. Yeah, and so yeah, there's a lot of ego management that goes on. It's so tempting to go, it's not ready. It's not ready. I, I'm, I'm yeah, positive absolutely. we can just ace this test. If you just gave me like six more weeks, they won't have any feedback. It'll be awesome. <laughs> but who knows yeah. if your feedback, the stuff you would do is even in the right direction. So it's like you have to be like, I'm going to put something crappy out there. It's bad. I know it. And, <laughs> and that's the point. And you have to embrace that. Yeah, and so I think we, you know, I always like to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, do you th actually let me ask you do you think that game development is more difficult or is it easier now because of that constant one-to-one -one feedback you know prior to this you know you kind of had to put a game out and you had to see what people thought now to your point of having streamers uh you get their instantaneous reaction instantaneous reaction and you don't know if it's like super based in in what's actually true or if it's just as you said a reaction so how do you see the development process in that sense would you rather get poked with a nail every day or have someone break your arm like at the end of the year? Um, yeah. <laughs> it's like it's like getting that constant feedback is like they're poking me and then but I can kind of react to that feedback on the fly and hopefully avoid like a, you know, in, in the olden days, you put it out. It was a Hail Mary that you threw and then and then the reviews would hit on launch day and you were like, oh, man, we made something bad or good. And I didn't really have a good gauge on that up until now. And now you get like a lot more pings back from the audience, you know, especially because we were a fig backed game. So we have people who are really passionate who are constantly kind of keeping us in check. Hey, are these features in, you know, it's not running on my computer or whatever. Um, and so that's kind of, it's, it's it, the olden days you just delayed that pain and sometimes it was a lot worse. And now I think with the feedback you do, your ego gets hit a lot more often, um, but then it's actionable and you can actually like avoid a much worse fate. Yeah, I think the answer is, is both, honestly. It makes a, our lives easier in some ways and harder in others. We just released the beta like they was saying and uh, immediately we saw some streamers hit some things that we're just kind of cringing about, right? But getting that feedback absolutely helps. And it, I think is critical in today's day and age. Um, getting fast feedback and a and, uh, wide perspective on your game is hugely helpful to shipping a, a quality product. I think the flip side though, personally as developers, it's a, it's a bit of like walking the gangplank a little bit in that we're putting something out in front of people that's not you know, the shipping version of the game. It's, it's still raw, there's still bugs, there's still rough edges. And you have to have thick skin going into it because you know that there are, are flaws still that are and kinks that are getting worked out. Um, so I think we we need to kind of gut check ourselves a little bit more as developers and get comfortable with that. But the end result is better for the game and better for players. Yeah. And I imagine communication is part of that, right? Like really setting the expectations, especially in that beta phase, uh, phase I should say. Um, so what are other sort of tools that you would, or maybe, you know, suggestions you would give to small studios uh, that could help them as they get started in, in the development process? Uh, I'll, I'll take the first stab at this. Um, yeah, go for so it. one of Something that's and this this is this happens right at the start of your project, and it's something that's really easy to do. If you take a game designer and you lock him in a closet for a year or something, um, and just give him like a word processor, he's going to he or she is going to attempt to think of every edge case and solve every problem ahead of time. And then and then and then it's really kind of we fall into this trap in the past. So I'm speaking from experience. I've done this in the past that you kind of over design right at the start of the process. Uh, maybe it's because you don't have enough engineers online or whatever the ramp up process is. Um, and then and then you have this grand design that's ahead of you and then you kind of get married to it and then you insist that like, hey, none of your feedback is valid until all of my concerns and all of my edge cases and all of my systems have gone in. Um, it's very easy to fall into that trap because you feel like you thought through everything when really the best way to go about it is like, what is like, and people say this all the time, but it's hard to stick to. What is minimum viable product? What is the, what are, what are the core pillars of our game? Like in, in Wasteland, I need to be able to talk to people, make decisions and shoot, you know, and you could do that in a single level. And until those elements feel good, it's like, why are you adding a crafting system? Why are you adding um, uh, you know, customization system. Why are you doing all of this stuff until your pillars have really been solidified? And then also get a minimum element in because the, the path to fun might look a lot different once you're in it 
then, you know, you could build a basic shooter, but there's a really wide gap between uh, 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 PUBG and Fortnite from like a game systems perspective, from a feel perspective. How do the guns operate? How do those loot drops operate? You know, all the all that stuff. And those two games feel wildly different despite being in the same genre. But but you might not like you might implement phase one of like this is what I think a good feeling gun would feel like. And then that kind of informs a lot of other decisions as these knock on effects, you know, how the gun feels informs how healing feels informs how your classes are set up, you know, all of that. So it's really do not over design early on, just get the bare minimum and then start playing it and then start making those smaller decisions along the way to creep for- towards something that is fun and make sure each iterative step that you're taking kind of makes the game progressively more fun. Yeah, yeah I, I completely agree. These games tend to expand over the course of development as systems get fleshed out, as developers add in these neat ideas that come up along the way. I mean, it's it's dough that rises, right? So my advice is even if you are trying to build a big RPG kind of like this, start small. Start smaller than you think you need. Expose as much of your game systems to designers so that they can iterate and tune and try out crazy ideas without taking other departments down every time they want to see if something's fun or not. And just get the game playable as early as possible, playable internally by your dev team so that you can have those iterative cycles and playable externally so that you can get those perspectives. I mean, ultimately, one of the things that, that, that we've seen true over and over again is that 90% of the polish comes in in the last 10% of, of dev time because you spend much of your dev cycle just getting the game to function, getting it to work, getting it to hang together, get all the pieces there, that it doesn't leave a lot of time to polish. So anything you can do to kind of stretch that, that last 10% of the dev cycle, either by pulling in iteration earlier or by trying to stretch things out further, that is directly going to impact the quality of your game. And I think that comes back to iteration, getting the game playable early, and keeping your focus tight. Cool. These are some great tips. I, like, if I were a developer, like, these are the tips that I want to know. Um, so let's go deeper into Wasteland 3. Uh, obviously, strategy game. Let's go very specific to this. In the save game doc that we just kind of saw, um, you all talked about the, some of the fundamentals that you're trying to implement as far as a strategy game goes. One example was, you know, focus on the actual player's turn because if you focus on what the enemy is doing, that can suck them out of, of the experience. Uh, what kind of tips would you give for someone building a game that's similar to yours? Um, I, I think there it's it's easy to get bogged down in the minutia of like the mathematics of the game. Uh, you know what I mean? Exactly how are actions spent? How much does everything cost? You know, uh, uh, but you really need to focus. <sighs> like Wasteland, going from Wasteland Two to Wasteland Three, for instance, was a real exercise in figuring out what were the fun and impactful decisions that the players were making, and what were these superfluous decisions the players were making. For instance, do we require the player manually reload their weapons at the end of the turn? No, it's kind of a rote action that we can just automate because it's not a meaningful. Like uh, RPGs are about decisions, but that's you can kind of take the face value and just give people total control. But then you end up with, um, and not to bash it, it's cool for what it is, but like Arma, like like. Just legit Arma, has like 110 little commands. I can control every little aspect of my character. But are all of those actions really super impactful? And then so for for our game specifically, like we want to automate everything that's not a a real decision that's going to impact the world or impact like the course of your character. Um, So like another good example is like when a character goes down in combat, we're just going to automatically revive them at the end of combat because at the end of combat, there's no time pressure. So you're just going to walk over and revive them anyways. So can we just save you that effort so that you can really be focusing on decisions that matter? And I think a side effect of that is it, it makes it feel like all your decisions matter even more because we've made sure the only decisions you're making are the ones that matter. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I couldn't agree more on that. You just have to keep the player experience front and center, right? And we want the player experience to be players making interesting choices as much as possible, as consistently as possible, and then seeing reactions to that. And so what you have to do is, I think, keep that focus at all times, check your decisions against it, and be ruthless about editing out anything which doesn't further your goals and make that user experience better, right? Anything that you are developing just because it's something you like as a developer or that that somehow was a holdover from previous versions or something that does not contribute to the player experience is basically a tax against your development effort that makes it harder for you to really polish the things that do matter. And so I think just consistently checking what your design is and what your, your game is forming up to be and then kind of paring back and trimming out anything which doesn't which doesn't help support your core goals is, is really essential. 
That's, yeah, that's amazing. I mean, I feel like the key word there is meaning, be, making sure everything's meaningful, right? Whether that be everything in the development process or the actions that the players are taking, like making sure that you're very deliberate, which is fantastic. And so this entire thing has been about process and I'd love if we could end it on, on uh, actually, so I just want to say thank you so much for joining us and kind of talking us through okay. this process because I think developers are going to be able to take, take some really good stuff away from this as far as game design and of course pro game development. Um, so again, thank you so much for joining us uh, and practicing social distancing with us. Uh, it's been fantastic. We're actually gonna now go over to Rikari uh, and we'll see what he has, who knows? Appreciate you, Malik, and that's right, it's time to talk about you, specifically what you're saying on Twitter and Discord. You've been talking so much that our channels were truly excited. And we've collected a few of the questions that you've been submitting, and now it's time to catch up on the answers. So, as I go through Discord here, actually that talk there was just great, and in that bit, uh, this one came through, I wanna say, Mysterious Herc on Mixer said, I normally don't like turn-based RPGs, but this looks awesome. Fully agree. Like, who knows what sort of game that you would like. Don't, don't judge a book by its cover. Give it a shot. Look, that's all I can say there. Um, let's go through the rest of them. What do we get? I think xCloud could be the most massive improvement in gaming history. That's from Magic Mart. This is another one that was in Discord. An interesting side note, I found using the DirectX Toolkit to be a really good way to learn C++ programming because I already knew basically what it did and how to use it because of previous experience with XNA. And then last one, going back to that talk that we just had, a good quote, a great quote for real. Would you rather get poked with a nail every day or have your arm broken at the end of the year? That's easy, that's a nail poke. I'm not, not I, don't, I don't wanna, I don't wanna break my arm. And I heard we have a few tweets that we can actually get thrown up on the screen. So let's do that and I'll read them out. This one from Structed, you missed GameStack Live yesterday, you wanna rewatch it? Hit that link, go check out the recordings. That's aka.ms slash GameStack On Demand. And our next one here from Dust Scratch. The talks on accessibility from GameStack Live, including Gears 5 and as an example, were great to consider in future projects as a game dev developer. It's difficult adapting for as many players as possible and seeing case studies helps inspire all of us to be more inclusive. Thank you for that note. And this one from Select Starter. GameStack Live Instant, what it means to run a game studio, a conversation with Turn 10. We appreciate you for sharing that out. Um, for those of you that are watching at home, Go to GameStack.com, and if you hit the check it out on GameStack Live, there's a link to the Discord, and I'm sure we can get that thrown up on screen at some point, too. Join the conversation. Get in there. We want to hear from you. Or use that GameStack Live hashtag. Reply to the Twitter account we got set up. Get those comments and whatnot in. All right. Well, now it's time for our first panel of the day. But first, let's check out this short clip all about audio design from The Coalition. talk audio, generally um, people think, as you say, VO, sound effects, music, but there's a lot of tech involved. We thought, you know, let's really take this seriously on Gears 5 and start from the ground up with accessibility in mind. If you're going to put sound in, make sure it's sound that's important. All of these questions started getting asked, like, what is an important sound? Which sounds are should be higher priority than other sounds? Gears of War is a very complicated game. There's a lot of sounds coming at you at once. So one of the things we wanted to do anyway was to make that easier to understand. So we wanted to um, assign priorities to sounds and then give them a higher or lower priority ranking depending on how important it was to you. Even though it was a lot of hard work, the outcome would be a much more controlled mix. We work with our code team to implement features that will help us with our mixing. And so based on the AI and where you are in the game, we have these values that come in and then we can assign those sounds from that particular enemy to be higher priority. And they're actually um, some of our priority mix settings. So you can see actually if I'm in line of sight, that red arrow is on me. Some of these numbers here changing our, our user cone and priority settings. There's a lot of ducking going on here. Um, so that's actually my weapon is actually turning down other sounds in the game. People with 
you know, impaired vision have shown that they can play gears because of this. Uh, there's, we have a few people that are actually almost blind that play gears and they uh, use the sound cues to let them know where things are coming from and it's spatialized and coming from a certain direction. It's a bit of tech, a lot of software, a lot of um, code time, you know, giving us values that we could use to tune the levels and volumes. The actual result of that is just that the mix is clearer, it's easier to understand, and you can hear where things are coming from. Online services are an integral part of the next generation of game development. And here to tell us more, we have James Trott, Christina Parker, James Gortzman, and Jesse Jasanov. Thank you guys for being here and joining us. Hello. Thank Welcome you for having here. us. Hello. Yeah, we got all four of you here, so please let me know if you guys have any other additional opinions if I don't call out to you. It might be, I'm afraid we're going to talk over each other a little bit, but let me know if you have anything that you want to add. But uh, before we continue, guys, we want to hear from you, the viewers at home, and how you have harnessed the power of online services, because that's what we're going to be talking about today. So let's jump into our Discord and tell us all about it. Now, yesterday we discussed the state of the industry, and you can check out that last segment on our YouTube playlist, including all of our uh, segments that we've had soon. But we're gonna pick up from there. And uh, I'm gonna start this off right now with uh, Christina. How are online services playing a role in the evolution of modern game development? Well, I think that they've been really impactful on modern game development. It's not that you just play a game and play the game for 10 hours and you move on to the next game. It's elongating the life cycle of games. Um, players and game developers alike are expecting these games to last much longer and become more personal to the player. So, James, I know I got to talk to you yesterday about live ops, and I want to know more about your opinion on how online services are playing a role in evolution. If you can just reiterate a bit more on that. Yeah, it's exactly what we just were saying that, you know, as games become communities where players are going to be in there for the long haul, uh, you've got, it's not enough to just ship code down to the client and, and leave it there. You've got to have engagement between players. You've got to have the opportunity to do updates and, and, and edit the game on the fly. And all of that requires things that live out in the cloud on the servers. Uh, probably the biggest area where people think about it first are for sure multiplayer games. Just the technology required for a player to play against another player. You've got to do matchmaking. You've got to be able to manage chat conversations. You've got to manage all the moves to the players that are coordinated. All of that's going through servers in the cloud and, and require those services. And no one wants to build those for themselves from scratch. You want to be able to use where you can off-the-shelf tech that's proven and tested. Because when games fail on launch day, more often than not, it's because the servers just can be, can't keep up with the load. Because that's it's the hardest thing in the world when you launch a new game, and often your biggest day is the first day you put it out there. James Trott, is there anything else that you would like to add there? Yeah, I think services have kind of extended the lifespan of games for developers and changed the way the industry thinks about shipping games and shipping content. Now with live services, developers are able to create little micro packages of content, stream them into their games. Even small indie games uh, like Kate Bash or Celeste are able to make micro content tweaks or small additions to the game over time, which substantially increases the <coughs> lifespan of that game for the developer and the player. Yeah, uh, I definitely agree with you, James Trott. And again, uh, to Gortzman, this is something that we were talking about before, that that lifespan of a game has really grown and expanded, not just with multiplayer online games, but with RPGs as well. And, and Jesse, I want you to talk a little bit more about that. Why is it that we're seeing more of these games kind of adopt these online services? Well, I think it's, I'll point out also, it's not just the live operations, but um, even before the game is launched, people are testing um, different types of content. Uh, via ads and click-throughs with different audiences, um, with tools like Facebook or other online ad networks. So people are getting a better read on what the audience is like or have affinity for. Um, I also think as people start adapting games to different surfaces, like mobile, for example, you see latent demand unlocked as they figure out better UX systems. And those UX systems can be figured out because you're running A-B tests with audiences to see what resonates, what makes people stick, when do they drop off, all those things. So I think it's kind of change how fast things evolve and which platforms are able to be reached in a way that's actually delightful to customers. Well, Jesse, can you talk a little bit more about that, relying on audiences a bit more for not just feedback when the game launches, but beforehand? How has that changed? How has developers communicated with audiences during the, the development stage? Well, I think you saw this early with like the advent, like gosh, maybe like a decade ago with Facebook games. Um, you know, people could run really small tests, and even 
even without gameplay, right? Like you can have an ad that goes to a survey and that ad gives an expression of what the game could be. And if people just completely vomit on it, you don't have to waste your time building the thing because you know people hate it. Um, or you can say, oh, wow, like I have an idea that people like the game, but here's a bunch of different variants of art styles that I can test with it. Which one resonates with the audience I'm targeting? Um, and then that can lead, like I said, to a survey where you can get other information about what people want out of the game. I think um, you combine that with looking at... Um, verbatim feedback with actually player behavioral feedback as well. And oftentimes you'll see a discrepancy with what people say and how they behave. Those are usually the most interesting cases where you want to dig in deep and find out what's actually going on with your community. Christina, how important is that for developers being able to get that instant feedback? How does that impact development? Yeah, it's kind of like what In Exile was just saying about iteration. It's the earlier you can get that feedback, the better that you can make your game for the player at launch. And live services and a live ops game kind of exist pre-launch. You really want to test and build those muscles ahead of time. And getting players in, running those experiments <coughs> helps build those muscles for developers as well. Uh, James Gordon, I'm going to focus on you. But if anyone else has any opinions on this, please let me know. Uh, at a high level, how would you define online game services? Sure. So any any time the game is reaching out and taking advantage of code that's not running on the game client or running out either on a server or in a cloud, that's a, that's an online game service. Some services are provided by the platforms themselves. So if you're building a game for Xbox, you may be using our Xbox Live services, which provide things like matchmaking and, and some multiplayer tech. Uh, if you're um, you may be taking advantage of services like PlayFab, which are available across all platforms. So for example, PlayFab provides analytics or a feature where you can <clears throat> gather data from the game uh, and put it into a, 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 a data warehouse in the cloud so you can do analysis and reports to help understand what your players are actually doing. Uh, and then some game services are part of the game itself. So for example, some games may actually, multiplayer games especially, may, or, or maybe mobile casual games, may have code that's running in the cloud sort of simulating the game even when a player is not connected so that when you connect back up again, the game is continuing to, to live and, and, and thrive. I guess an, R, an MMORPG would be a great example of this, where the whole world is continuing to run, even if the player is not connected to it. Right, that's true, that's true. Anyone else have any other opinions on a high-level example of online services? No, I'm going to take that as a no. Good. Uh, James Trott, I, I want to know a little bit about game streaming. Is it a service or is it kind of a separate platform? That seems to be a lot of questions that gamers are asking recently. And how does this change how developers think about game services? I think it's both dependent on how developers want to consume it and integrate it with their game. Uh, originally, streaming was very definitely sort of a separate service. It's more of a media service where you're able to stream gameplay and things like that. But you're seeing developments now in the industry, and it kind of started with Mixer and their mix play functionality, where they were able to bring interactivity into the platform where viewers can interact and influence the game. Uh, there was this game called The Darwin Project that allowed you to give power-ups and bonuses and rewards to your favorite players in an arena uh, kind of brawler. And that brought a new level to building community for the game and let the viewers interact with the game even before they've ever played it, support their favorite streamers and grow the community around that game. Jesse, I want to ask the same th uh, question to you about streaming services or is it a separate platform? I actually think it's a complicated answer. Um, in the one hand, if you're streaming from a racked Xbox or something like that, um, it's really you're programming to the same surface. However, um, the consumption of that output is being consumed on a screen that you could be something completely different than you're prepared for. So think about things like font sizes and other things. Usability, a touchscreen versus a controller. Um, in, a, in a console environment, it's a very controlled um, experience, right? You, you assume the person has control, or you assume they're connected to a television. I think with streaming, while technically it gives you more reach per your sort of technical effort, um, you still have to consider the UX, and that also opens up a whole other can of worms in terms of like, how do I acquire customers? In a traditional console game, especially box retail, is just brand marketing, right? Um, now you can actually buy ads on the console. But once you're streaming to mobile devices and mobile endpoints, if you think about the ad ecosystem there and performance marketing, um, it opens up a whole new way to acquire customers that can actually play your game now almost on any endpoint. So the idea that you can reach a massive amount, a massive number of more people and have actually a way to engage them uh, through performance marketing is actually going to be really, I think, um, interesting in its impact on the industry. Christina, is that why... Oh, sorry, please. I think another way in which game streaming services like xCloud are going to change things that we haven't really anticipated yet is actually on the iteration and testing side. So we were just talking about, in, in the last uh, session, talking about how important iteration and speed of iteration is. And actually, when you're building console games today, one of the slowest parts of the, or one of the slow parts of the pipeline 
is getting your game up onto your console so you can test it. You know, downloading the bits and uploading them every time you make a small change. But if you imagine streaming where you're building your game in the cloud and playing it off the cloud, you can potentially speed up that iteration time and give the game creators even faster feedback loops while they're building new content. And I think we're only scratching the surface. We're just now starting to realize how that notion of, of streaming off of cloud services to play, not just build, can also affect the uh, dev experience. Well, James, there's a lot of oh, please, sorry again. Say, there's a lot of other different things too, like just to build on what James is saying. I think, you know, when you often have different versions of your game in the wild, whether it's because of an A/B test or because you have a critical update, you don't have to rely on users to update their client. Once you update the cloud, it's it. It's updated for everybody. So that actually makes it a much more controlled environment for devs in a lot of ways. Well, uh, James G, going back to what you were saying, like this is really just the, the, the beginning of online uh, streaming for the, the, the cloud. What's next? How can it go bigger from here? Gosh, I, I think, I think the, one of the big questions is starting to look at truly massive, massive multiplayer games. So one of the areas that I've often thought um, we have opportunities around is open world gaming. And so you look at a game like Red Dead Redemption, the team that built a game spent an enormous amount of love, blood, sweat, and tears building the world for Red Dead Redemption, and it's essentially being used right now for one game. But starting to ask yourself, what if you take that world and open it up as almost like a platform where other games could be built inside the world of Red Dead? That starts to become almost like, like world as a service. You know, we have a new flight simulator game coming out later this year in which the entire world you're flying around in is, is actually done through machine learning algorithms building off of satellite data. So we actually are flying your airplane through the real world as, as recreated from satellite imagery. I think this notion of, of, of vast new areas and worlds that we can play in is going to be really interesting. And that's a service that we don't have today. You know, game, game world as service we haven't yet seen. I think we're going to start to see that. Christina, I want to know your opinion on game streaming as a service compared to it being a, a platform and, and how it's been impacting uh, the game industry recently. Yeah, I really agree with James, where I think it's a bit of both, where it's definitely a service that, that we provide, and it's also a platform for new developers or for a different way for a, a developer to reach a different market or a different platform. And it's building for mobile when you might not have necessarily had that uh, as, a, as a platform previously. So I think going forward, it's, it's thinking about and also kind of what Jesse was saying of how quickly you can access it. So I think it's both. It's about building for platforms you might not be used to as a developer, but it's also about thinking about how quickly players can access it. And what does that mean for player behavior? And what does that mean for the games you're making? Have you seen changes in player behavior? Um, not me personally yet, because I'm still really new to the game streaming side of it. From game services, though, it's definitely been changed in player behavior about even in player expectation for live games. And I'm interested to see how that evolves as game streaming um, becomes broader. Well, then let's talk well, a bit more change, about And then one change we've seen in consumer behavior is you no longer have to download and install the game to play it. And so the ability to basically go from a friend to say, hey, I'm playing this new game and it's great, check it out, to basically say, hey, I'll try that out, taking the invitation, one click, and a few seconds later, you're playing the same game, no install time, that I think really will start to change consumer behavior and it will start to make it easier to grow a new audience around the game. I also want to comment, you know, I was talking earlier about the, how streaming is changing the development experience. Now that a lot of us are working from home because of the, 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 the COVID-19 virus, uh, you start to realize that things like dev kits, which are often expensive and, and, and hard to move around, hard to bring home with you. And so in a world where you're able to move more and more of your development to the cloud, it starts to make it easier to have a remote team and or be working from home, which is something that, you know, sad to say, we may have to think more about in the future. James Trott, well, it's not even kind of, just oh, the sorry, sickness, guys. I was say. It's also, <laughs> labor markets are also inherently immobile. So enabling you to actually access talent in other parts of the world actually makes this a lot easier, uh, too. But uh, uh, James, I want to go off a bit about what James G was saying there, that the, the difficulties that game developers are starting to see there, what, what uh, difficulties have you seen? It, it, we've covered a lot about the, the test cycle and things like live streaming allow that dev test, that dev test loop to kind of go around and around much quicker. Uh, James is right with the unavailability of physical dev kits and with the number of platforms that are introduced through game streaming, whether that's mobile devices, consoles, handheld, PCs, it's expanding the test and developer surface. One of the cool things about those dev kits being part of that streaming experience and available through the cloud is we exist in this world then of kind of develop anywhere. And so the development experience becomes develop where you want, using the tools you want. You can even develop in the cloud and have real-time feedback through a streamed instance of your game. 
So you're able to effectively live debug or live edit and fine tune aspects of your game thanks to that streaming service you know, coming straight down to your test device. We actually have a, uh, a question from our Discord channel. If you guys are watching right now and want to be a part of the conversation, please hop into our Discord or you can post it into our Mixer chat. But we got a question saying, in a world where working from home is becoming more key, an example isolation, what's the biggest challenge to ensure collaboration and keeping on track? Jesse, I want to start with you. Well, uh, the collaboration, keeping on track, I think it all comes down to really how good the tools you have are, right, uh, for communication. Do you have live video? Um, a lot of human communication deals with looking at body language, microtransactions in the face, tone, uh, and actually the words you say, right? So uh, with voice or text, you just have the words. With, with voice, you have tone and words. And with video, you have some notion of, like, seeing. So I think there's so much information that's conveyed that you're missing out on if you don't have, like, a physical view of the person. I think that's the biggest challenge. And I think, like, you know, I always say, I was saying to someone yesterday, if I were an IC dev just writing code, I'd probably be twice as productive. Um, <laughs> and, and if I have to have, like, a bunch of meetings with a bunch of different people on schedule them and get them in with connectivity and stuff, it actually makes things a little more challenging. So I think that's, that's how I think about it. No, I, I definitely have to agree. This interview alone for me has been a bit challenging <laughs> trying to figure exactly. out who's going to talk next. Uh, Christina, have you seen any challenges recently with what we've been going on with uh, the self-isolation and working from home? Yeah, I think it's a lot what Jesse was uh, commenting on as well about how it's really difficult to take dev kits home. And so therefore playing the game regularly and iterating on your software can be a bit difficult. Um, and it's about that collaboration. It, game development, software development is very collaborative. So you don't have that face-to-face -face interaction with the partners on your team as much and playing together quickly and working together quickly is very important and that can be disrupted from working from home. James Trott, I'm gonna ask you the same question, but I also wanna ask a, a second part to this, that have you seen any benefits from working from home? So one of the biggest challenges is remembering to maintain those touch points and those collaboration points that you would normally have with your team. Uh, when we're physically co-located uh, or we're scheduling meetings and we're meeting regularly, uh, there are a lot of kind of touch points and water cooler moments where you might sync with somebody or exchange information almost implicitly. As you move into this distributed remote world, that kind of goes away. So you have to remember to, to reinforce things like daily stand-ups, take time to connect with team members, over-communicate, and really share as much information as possible about what's going on in the project, what's going on with you. You have to kind of proactively project that information out into however you're collaborating through something like maybe Microsoft Teams. Um, in terms of benefits, I think Jesse kind of hit the nail on the head. Uh, there's also a lot of implicit disturbances that happen in the workplace, people coming by to ask questions ad hoc. And it really gives you time to kind of focus and engage with the work and, and crank out a lot of code and, and do a lot of building kind of work by yourself, thanks to that kind of isolation and that, that clear boundary. James G, do you feel like you have less distractions now or do you feel like this isolation is a bit more of a hindrance? Well, I think, you know, the, the, the joke going around is all my friends who are introverts are loving this and my friends who are extroverts are hating it. And I think there's this truth to that. Those of us who are in collaborative roles are basically having to be in video calls all day long. And it, it's definitely more taxing than being able to sit in a physical room with people and have a meeting. But those of us who are individual contributors and are happy to basically close the door and just crank, you know, are, are, are really feeling more productive. I, I do think those importance of those, those daily huddles and those social get togethers uh, are important. And, you know, some of my teams have actually been getting together once a day to get on the phone and just chat about social stuff, no work talk allowed, because those are the kinds of informal chats that are not happening. Uh, back at PopCap Games, when I used to work there, we had some key designers who were off-site. And one of the side benefits is it forced a lot of the key design discussions to happen through text chatting, which meant there was a historical record. And so one benefit of moving to remote work is that it forces all of us to use tools that have a, a there's more of an archive function now kind of built in where we can go back in time and see what was happening. And we may find later that that actually proves to be a benefit versus when you're all in the same office, you can often cut corners and maybe not document or, or, or capture some of the key discussions you're having. Uh, James Trott, what would you say are some examples of games that are using online services really well today? Well, we saw a lot about it yesterday, but for me, one of the kind of best in class examples is Sea of Thieves. They've really taken live ops and analytics to the core of how they build and maintain their game, how they balance their economy, examine player behavior, and how they evolve that next generation of content for the game. End-to-end, -end, Sea of Thieves uses gaming services to enrich the experiences for the player, real time in the game that they're playing and in every iteration of content that they produce and publish. Christina, is there any games or developers out there that you see using online services really well? 
Yeah, well, he stole my answer. I was going to say Sea of Thieves, <laughs> but uh, um, I also think Supercell, uh, which is mobile developer of Clash of Clans, they do a really great job having live services embedded from the very beginning and embedded in their studio culture as well. Uh, James Gwertzman, this is actually something that we wanted to talk about yesterday, but we didn't have time to talk about it. But I think that we can kind of follow up with this question here, is that it seems like different genres of games use online services differently. Can you tell me a little bit about how online services affect those genres from its MMOs to MOBAs to mobile games? Yeah, absolutely. I think mobile games uh, you know, are relatively new to console and PC developers who are starting to think, figure this out now. But in the world of, for example, uh, MMORPGs, you know, the game, the genres had this in since the days of MUDs, you know, 30 years ago. And it's like mobile games, a lot of mobile games, especially free-to-play games, had to have these services baked in from the beginning uh, in order to run a free-to-play game or else you're simply not going to make any money. You're not going to be able to, to survive as a game studio if you haven't figured that out. So I think mobile game studios have had to evolve and use services uh, uh, well ahead of, of, um, of, of these more traditional AAA developers. You know, Zynga, for example, which started actually doing sort of social gaming and then social mobile gaming, you know, they were one of the earliest leaders in sort of online services here in North America. Uh, but what they were doing was was actually several years old compared to what was happening over in Korea or, or, or China. Um, Jesse, I want to know your opinion on, on how different genres are handling online service differently. And it definitely seems like more and more game genres are starting to pick up, even role-playing games, which we were used to just, you release the game, and then that's it, you get nothing else. How has it evolved? Yeah, I think it's interesting because when you're streaming and when you're racking up server costs from running live services, every minute of engagement now is a minute of cost. So if you have a fixed price once and no other way to monetize players, eventually if they've loved your game enough for years and years, you'll probably end up losing money, right? So you have to think of it like a true service where there's a cost to running the service and charging customers fairly. I think um, you know you look at some of the genres that have come through through sort of social and mobile, they've been really light in terms of like um, the production value and that's been getting better. Um, and I think, again, like I think the latent demand over time for figuring out how to adapt certain genres to be effective service-based games and effectively run on different platforms. Um, you know, look at like Pokemon Go. I think there was latent demand for capturing a Pokemon as many generations of people um, always wanted to do that. I grew up with it. And then finally, when you were able to, there was this like groundswell of people running around finding Pokemons, which kind of right now, given COVID, we were in like the bizarre opposite world of that. Um, but I think, yeah, there's a potential for um, these genres to all be adapted, and they all will, right? I mean, I think um, game developers are sharp, they're passionate, and they will figure out how to best adapt these genres for, for online play. And I think you can look at the ones that haven't really been um, adopted yet. Um, some of them have actual physical limitations. Like an RTS, playing that on a mobile screen versus a giant high-res monitor gives you a distinct advantage, right, yeah. um, on the high-res monitor. So I, I think certain genres, the ones that are turn-based, um, designers also have to think about, like, snack size gameplay. Like if even if I can bring the couch to you with streaming on your phone, I may not have a gap of time long enough to experience that. And I think there's gonna be a lag where AAA developers realize, hey, players are playing this in different places. They need a way to engage with a meaningful amount of progress or good feeling about the game or positive interaction that's short enough that they can fill those pockets of time that people are right now using for things like words with friends where you take a quick turn and go, right? Maybe that's an extreme example, but still, it needs to be like a five minute experience that you can have. You can't always have time to sit on your couch even if I can bring it to you. No, I, Jesse, I kind of want to follow up a little bit on that and something that you mentioned, Pokemon Go, which was quite revolutionary. My, my mother, who's never played Pokemon or seen Pokemon at all, was playing Pokemon Go. So what kind of revolutions are we seeing in gaming right now similar to that that online services has brought to not just the gaming community but to the world as a whole well i think that's one good example i think um you know another one of the things that james talked about earlier which haven't really happened yet but i, I expect to happen um you know you're seeing like massive worlds that you're able to fill up easier right um, when you think about streaming as well the ability to just jump in without a download um, that'll lead to like ad units and things like that as well that are new and novel um I think I'll, I'll, I'll uh, jump into you know, one. being able to provide. Sure. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, take Roblox for example. Roblox and and actually even Minecraft are really fascinating in that these are games that are themselves creative tools, and you see user generated content and sort of player generated content is becoming more and more important in in these games as communities. And it used to be only mod makers were in there making content, and it was an active part of the game, but it was still a small minority of the players who were also creators. And in the case of Roblox, they've got millions, literally millions of games on their platform now created by, in many cases, you know, 8 to 12-year-old kids. And so I think that notion of game player as also creator is, an, is a neat shift. And you're starting to see more roles of uh, emerge 
uh, as you shift to services that, that give you as a player more opportunities. You're no longer just having to play. You can play, you can stream, you can create, you can consume, you can buy, you can, you can, you know, chat. There's a bunch of more ways to engage. Oh, I think I have, a, I have a slightly also different view on that, which Please. is um, I agree with everything James said, but I would also say people talk about UGC. Um, I think the most ubiquitous form of UGC is actually just multiplayer. The fact that you show up to play against somebody, you're providing UGC that if you weren't there, you'd need a bot for, right? So it's the most natural way to do UGC because all you have to do to provide your content is just be a player. And so I think multiplayer is like the most base level of UGC in some sense, if you think of it that way. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we have a question from Mixer again. Do we need such a powerful console in cloud gaming and streaming is the future? From Magic Mart 8, uh, let me ask that question again. Do we, need a such, uh, do we need such a powerful console if cloud gaming and streaming is the future? Oh, okay, so they're asking, why, why are we seeing bigger and better consoles if it seems like we're moving towards streaming services? All right, I think it's an and. I think, you know, you always have to pay for the console somewhere. And so you know, if you choose to buy the console and pay for it up front and have it in your living room, then it's yours and you can have it for the life cycle of, of your, your, you know, your, your, your enjoyment of that, of that platform. But in the case of if you don't want to buy the console up front or if you want to have it on devices like mobile phones or PCs when you're out and about, then you need to stream it. And, and now you're basically paying effectively by the hour. Now, there may be subscription services, there may be hourly fees, but ultimately it's now changing that into a from a one-time payment into a uh, an ongoing you know stream of, of fees, and uh, I think that's fine. It's it chooses sort of how you want to access it. Because what, what 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 streaming will do is it will open up the world of gaming to a much broader audience, and so the hardcore gamers will still be buying consoles, and we're going to have the best, fastest, most awesome consoles for people who want to have those experiences. But we now have this opportunity to provide that same experience to people who may not want to make that front commitment. And, and, and there, I think, we're going to ultimately grow the world of gaming, and that's great for all of us. Christina, do you agree? Yeah, I agree with what James is saying. I don't think it's necessarily an either-or situation where you have to have a console <coughs> up front or you do game streaming. I think it's they provide different platforms, different types of gaming experience. And for some gamers, they'll want both. For some gamers, one will work better than the other. And I think it's about providing the accessibility and the options to the player. It's empowering the player to play however they want to play and access the content however they want to. Uh, James Tross, something that uh, Christina said there that maybe players will want one or the other. Which players are going to focus on streaming services compared to game consoles? I think it really depends on a couple of things. Uh, number one, super high-speed internet isn't ubiquitous. It's, it's becoming more widespread and prolific, but streaming services still rely on a certain amount of bandwidth to deliver the gaming experience to the end device. Also for people on the move, people traveling, people who prefer that mobile platform, but would maybe like a richer experience, stream services are great for them. I also think we're gonna see a move to a world where it's very much an and. When you think about a console, a console comes with an expected price point and a certain size and form factor. You want, to, you want it to be able to fit under your television. <clears throat> and there's only so much hardware we, we can fit in there. There's only so much that can be built in at a price point and a size that makes sense in the home scenario. <clears throat> when you think about something like a cloud where the resources are, are by the second or by the minute, the amount of compute power that you can bring to video gaming experiences to do things like cloud rendering where your gameplay and maybe procedurally generated scenery are rendering in real time on the cloud and being delivered to your console where your console is focusing on audio, gameplay, effects, particles. Mm. You're basically able to bring as many consoles as you want to the fore to deliver the gaming experience that you envision. Now, this is just kind of the question that I just asked, but we have another question from Discord. If game streaming services are the next big thing, which definitely seems to be going in that direction, what about people that don't have access to the internet? Jesse. Well, if you don't have access to the internet, you can't really stream games, but um, you also can't play any multiplayer games. So you're not, I mean, whether you're streaming it or playing it locally, you're not playing Fortnite if you're not on the internet, right? I mean, you, you just can't play with other people. Um, so I think, like, you know, it, it, the, the penetration of stream games has to match somewhat the, the map of uh, the connectivity that will support it, right? I think over time, though, you know, you have 5G coming. Um, there's costs with that. People on Wi-Fi will get it for whatever the base cost is. I think um, the Internet is spreading rapidly. There's lots of people on the Internet. And I think uh, it's just a matter of time. But, yeah, some people, if you don't have Internet, I think you're just out of luck. Uh, I want to shift our discussion a little bit. And, Christina, I want to ask you this first. Uh, tell us a little bit about the trends that we're seeing with game development and the use of online services. Well, I think the trends for game development, it's 
it's kind of on that iteration that in exile was speaking about and, and testing your services sooner and getting feedback from players sooner and incorporating that into the game development process. You know, it's no longer that box product mentality or games as a product where you put it out and you're done. It's starting much, much sooner in development process, testing your services, getting out to players, getting iteration and incorporating that into the whole process to get towards games as a community. Uh, James Trott, have you seen any other trends? Uh, what I start to see with developers now is kind of a new way of approaching development, whether that's for streaming or whether it's with the cloud. They're starting to think about how to pull all of these things into their games. And they start to think about, especially as you think about streaming, you start to think about how that runtime moves around. What runs where? Does it run on your device? Does it run in the cloud? We also see people thinking about a new kind of procedural content where the cloud is constantly running simulations and updating content without developer interaction. We worked on a project with Microsoft Technologies last year uh, for an MMO-like system for bosses that learn player behaviors in raid encounters. So as raids go on and people find dominant strategies, the bosses adapt in near real time, detect the strategies players are implementing. And now the challenge for developers is becoming how to tone back that machine learning and simulation given the amount of compute in the cloud so that the, the NPCs and monsters aren't perfect because with enough training and enough compute, they will beat the player every time. You kind of have to dial that back. We're seeing a lot of interesting things happen with gene genetic algorithms where the content evolves based on a few base principles into something new that the developer may never have envisioned, and that brings another set of challenges for them to solve. That's incredible. Uh, James, I want to ask you a little bit of a different question. We were asking the trends that we're seeing from game developers. What are the trends that we're seeing now from players? Has that changed at all in the last five years? Yeah, I think players are frankly expecting more now. Players, I think, you, used to be okay with the idea that, hey, I'm going to go and buy this game and, and I'm going to play it and enjoy it and, and basically consume the director's vision. And maybe they, if they didn't like the ending, they would go online and rant about the ending, but they didn't really have a lot of power over development. Now, with these games that are being continually updated, players have a much louder voice. I like to think of players as sitting at the design table alongside the designers. They're no longer sort of across the table. And so with that power, you know, also comes responsibility. And, and game developers have to figure out how to listen to players and incorporate feedback and adapt games for what's working without necessarily completely pandering and, and, and losing their artistic vision. And so there's definitely a, a, a mix there. One of the game studios that we work with is called uh, uh, Colbury Games. They have a, a very simple game called Idle Miner Tycoon, uh, which is a, one of the Idle Cooker games. They released the initial game version in, I think, six weeks of development. And then they proceeded to have an update every 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 week or even in some cases twice a week. And they just updated and updated and updated and iterated over time. And they grew that game to quite a level of success. And so you no longer have to, you really can release now a much simpler experience and sort of see what's working with your players and, and, and adapt and iterate around that and, and, you know, build your way to success that way. This is a word that you guys keep on saying, you know, iterating and, and updating. And we have a lot of developers watching us right now. How often should a developer update their game? Is there really a rule of thumb with that, uh, James G? No, there's no rule of thumb. It's going to depend entirely on, on, on everything from their appetite, the, the, the genre they're in, the, the nature of their players. Um, I, think, I think the mindset shift, the culture shift, though, is every game developer is going through this culture shift of I am now and is always, always updating, always ongoing experience. And, and just... Just getting to that mindset shift takes, we've seen as anywhere from you know, two to six years for traditional developers who are used to doing it more the waterfall model. Um, but that's okay. And as, as we get there, as the whole industry becomes more fluid, we start to see new experiences emerging. Jesse, I want to know your opinion on that because I feel like you got one. <laughs> yeah, I think the answer to that question is uh, faster than your competitors. <laughs> to put it simply, because if you have a game in the same genre as your competitors and you're updating weekly and they're updating daily, the learning cycle that they're having is 7x yours with the player base, you will die. <laughs> like That's basically it right at the end of the day. So I think and if you look at what's happened with performance marketing, um, players that game companies that have, actually have high LTVs and can tolerate um, a, a, a timeline where they can invest cash, like a working capital cycle, uh, longer than you, 
Um, they can just blot out the sun basically to put it in like 300 Xerxes terms in terms of buying ads and you can't breathe. So I think like um, operational agility is really critical for operating these games. And if you can find something, um, the best insights are ones that are not widely known. Like you find something that's counterintuitive about the audience um, and you can actually use that to grow the audience because you can buy for a period of time, but eventually people will figure it out because they'll deconstruct your game and catch up. And so it's a constant uh, battle. It's actually really, really difficult and brutal. I think anyone that's worked... Um, for mobile native for long enough has experienced this, and this is coming to console and PC, in my opinion. Yeah, without do, a doubt. Do we need to explain then what performance marketing is? That may be a, a new term for some developers. I think it used to be, you know, you put the game in the store, and that was your marketing. And maybe you buy ads, but that was about it. Performance marketing is this idea of running ads, where the ad is directly clickable to get you right back into the game and to drive an install. And so this notion of paying for ads uh, has a certain amount of cost for every new install you get. And as long as the cost to get a new player to install your game is lower than the revenue you're going to get from the player over their lifetime, then you're ultimately profitable. But if you're paying more to get a game player to install your game than you're going to make from that player, you can't run your business. You're going to ultimately go out of business. And so there's a fine line there between what your cost to acquire a new player is and what your revenue from that player is. And so you've got to keep these balanced. Yeah, and to put a finer point on what James was just saying, I think for companies that have a lot of money and large um, war chest, they can afford to spend a dollar and then say, hey, in 12 months, if we get the dollar back, great. A small company may say, oh, we're, we're living paycheck to paycheck. We can only afford to keep that money tied up in marketing for 30 days. And so ultimately, the other company can bid higher than you. And that's actually like a prob- problematic, right, um, with, with performance marketing. It creates a, an additional challenge that hadn't been present before this. Right, which, which pushes the onus back on online service. To bring it back to our topic, it brings it back to online services because if you can make your game more viral and make your game more organic growth for players, word of mouth is taking over and encouraging your game to spread. So you're not relying on paid ads. That's how, as a smaller studio, you can still survive. So your bigger, you know, more well-funded competitor is buying up a bunch of ads. But if players are telling each other and selling your game organically because it's just a better game and it's more compelling and has a, has a more rapid you know, adoption loop, then you can still compete. Christina, I want to know a little bit about your opinion of what they, these two were just saying and, and focusing on ads with like player retention and how much money they're willing to spend on it. How important is the more marketing side of online services? I think it can be very important. I mean, it's the top of the funnel. It's a, it's a lot of where acquisition for your user base comes from, un- unless you have that virality K factor and you're getting the organic growth. Um, People will hear about your game mainly through ads, mainly through marketing, and then it's all about getting people into the top of the funnel, and then once they're in the game, having that really compelling game loop that retains them and keeps them in there. So without that top acquisition, you might have difficulty bringing people through the game. James Trott, anything else to add? I think one of the things that developers need to think about in this online services and kind of iterative world, as you said, is to think about it more like an evolution. Uh, Jesse kind of hit the nail on the head with, with that kind of more frequent than your competitors. But the important thing to remember is that your players are coming to enjoy and immerse themselves in the experiences that you're creating and taking an evolutionary view to how your game evolves over time, where you're taking data in from platforms like maybe Azure Analytics, PlayFab, where you're getting that real-time view into your player behavior, into how your game is performing, into changes you might want to make, and then taking things like Azure DevOps, uh, our our app services to do uh, blue-green deployments, which is this idea of changing the deployment of your services so that you don't interrupt the players playing. I think where a lot of developers go wrong is they take their game offline to make it better, but all the time that they're making it better, their players aren't able to enjoy it and they're losing time. Well, uh, James Trott, is that a shift that we're going to be seeing? We're going to see that less often because of the streaming aspect? I think as you get into streaming, it becomes even more important because if someone's playing your game streamed to a device, they don't want a a spinner to appear like, please wait, update loading. (laughs) They just want to keep playing. And so thinking about those strategies for changing content, changing configuration, PlayFab configuration management is just amazing for this. You just change little little tiny details underneath the player and it just realizes itself in your in your game. Uh, what James G was talking about earlier with world as a service is going to make this even more prolific where the world is able to change and evolve because that's being streamed directly into those games those gamer experiences. I want to shift focus. I also think oh please. 
Oh, I was going to say, community is actually really important here, too. Supercell, someone called out, doing a great job with online services. I think they also do a great job communicating with their audience and giving them a heads up as to what's coming. And I think when 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 uh, games don't do that, you see things like Marvel Contests or Champions where like audiences can revolt. And that's something you didn't see before online services as well. So communicating with the community from the developer actually really important to give, make people feel like they know what's coming. Uh, uh, to follow up on that, Jesse, do you think that there is a possibility of too much communication? Um, that's a good question. I think communication, no, because uh, it doesn't really impact the gameplay and people can choose to use it or not. But you can update too quickly. I've seen people get overwhelmed with content. Uh, I think this happened a little bit in Farmville. Um, you know, if people feel like they can't keep up and they're overwhelmed, um, you know, they, they can drop off the game. And so I think you have to find that right balance. And even you may have different segments within your game that are hungrier for more content and some that may feel overwhelmed. So the trick is being able to update it enough that you're actually learning as fast as you can, faster than your competitors, and uh, delighting your audience in all the segments that you have uniquely, which which can be a challenge if they're all in one shared game. Yeah, personalization. A... Sorry, I was going to say personalization is a theme that we're going to see more and more of. It's one of those uh, online services is your ability to target different experiences to different players. Because a player has just come in for the first time, you do not want to overwhelm them with the same experience that you may be you know, offering a, a level 80 player who's been in there for two years. And so you have to be able to uh, adopt your, your, your curves and, and, and have different game experiences for different types of players if you're going to have a game that's going to have a long time life. You know, when, when a game has been around for three or four, four years, you simply can't expect a new player to have the same experience by any stretch as a, as a long time player. I have a differing opinion about the communication. I actually believe you can communicate too often with your players. Um, depending upon how often you're communicating, you could be diminishing the message that you're sending through and diluting that. So um, you want to make sure that your players are reading your messages. And sometimes if you get too frequent, um, they can get burnt out on your messages. So you have to be really careful. And I think that comes into what uh, James was saying of personalization. So the more you learn about your players, the more that that can come into your communication as well. And you can give them targeted information that's important to them so they know that when you're communicating with them that it's something that they should read and that they'll care about. Jesse, I want to shift uh, topics a little bit. As a, as a platform and also as a service provider, what has Microsoft been doing to make game-specific services better for game development? Well, I think for starters, it's really listening to developers, trying to get a diverse view, uh, not just from internal studios, but from also external partners, um, trying to actually make it simple, um, trying to really... Um, Make it simple to see what you need and either we have it for you or we have an answer for you with a partner if we don't um, in our stack. And I think just trying to be clear, um, you know, I don't know, I, maybe James has a, has a better answer with PlayFab. No, I mean, I think, I think you nailed it. I think, you know, you know as, a, as a platform provider, we're just continually listening to our game developers and really trying to put the developers first and saying, what do our developers need to be successful? You know, the, the mission statement, uh, PlayFab is now part of an organization here at Microsoft called the Game Developer, um, Game Developer Experiences Organization. And, and, and we have as our mission statement, empowering game creators to realize their dreams. And it may sound a little bit you know, hokey, a little bit highfalutin, but we take it pretty seriously. You know, we really see ourselves as helping game creators be, be successful. You know, Microsoft's mission statement is essentially uh, empowering everyone to achieve more and you know, change everyone to developers. And that's very much what we, what we try to do. Uh, that's why I started PlayFab, you know, whatever, six years ago now is because I'd been a game developer for 20 years. I saw the rising curve of technology making it harder and harder for small studios to compete in, 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 a, in a world where online services were not just you know, useful but critical. Uh, that, it takes a lot of capital to build great online services at scale. And so you know, I see what we're providing and, and, and by harnessing the power of our cloud to help you know, even the smallest indie developer studio compete effectively on an equal playing field with the biggest studios uh, is critical to keeping you know innovation and, and creativity alive in our industry. Uh, James Traw, I want to ask you the same question on how Microsoft is impacting uh, these game-specific details for game development. I, I think Microsoft, and especially with Playfab, Playfab and the, the Game Developer Experiences team, is really practicing what we preach and a lot of what we're talking about here. We use every signal we can, whether that's sentiment, or feedback, or analytics in our own services to see what's working and what's not and really turn the dial on what will work best for game developers. I think it goes a little wider than game specific services too. A lot of the services that across our cloud offerings, across our analytics, our storefronts, uh, our live ops, just for regular software, you know, the biggest corporations in the world use these services and they're available 
in such a way that whether you're an indie developer or a AAA, we have an offering that will allow you to maximally realize your vision. And we're constantly tuning for developers of every type. Like James said, Microsoft's mission is to uh, enable every person on the planet to do and achieve more. And we do that by listening broadly and actioning that as quickly as possible with our own iterative cycles, growing our services, growing our presence, listening to the features that developers need, and allowing developers to build the game they want with the tools they want on and for the platforms they want. And that's how Microsoft is approaching this all up. Uh, we've been talking a lot about the high level, but I actually kind of want to go to the basic level of this with a lot of developers, maybe not even really knowing what PlayFab or GameStack is. How would they become a part of the Microsoft experience here with all the tools that they're using? Uh, James G. Sure. So, you know, go to GameStack.com. The team has built a really good website that has a lot of entry points there saying, depending on what kind of developer you are, what you're looking for, you can think of that as almost like a roadmap to all the different services Microsoft has, which can be overwhelming at times. So from GameStack.com, you can go into deep diving on PlayFab. You know, we have PlayFab.com, which is a website specifically for our online services offering. Azure, of course, has this vast set of services that you can tap into, uh, everything from your you know, raw compute and storage and, and networking services, all the way up to some pretty cutting edge machine learning and AI techniques that are available sort of off the shelf. Um, you know, we use Azure Cognitive Services inside of PlayFab to do things like real time uh, uh, language translation and real time closed captioning of audio streams. So there's some pretty cool technologies there. Uh, and then, of course, you've got our various platforms. We've got PC, we've got Xbox. It's a whole bunch of different materials specifically for those platforms that you can tap into. And who can use these platforms? Everyone. I mean, we literally are making our services available for everyone from the smallest hobbyist or, or two-person indie shop all the way up to working with some of the biggest AAA studios in the world. Well, that's awesome. Um, how have these services come to define the development of future games? What are game developers doing differently today? And, and Christina, I want to talk to you on this. Yeah, I think I touched on this earlier. I think it's about starting sooner in the development process. I mean, services have always, uh, from at least an online game point of view, have been something that's been needed to be created to support the game. But it's bringing other services online earlier, and it's using them earlier. So it's like I said, it was about iterating, about putting content out there and, and getting feedback and building on those services and building on the game using those services. I mean, I'll, I'll jump in. In the early days of this online services space, you had to build the services at the same time you built your game. And so you often didn't have a chance to test your game with the services incorporated until the very last minute. And oftentimes it was, it was too late to make changes at that point. But now that a lot, a lot of the services you need are available sort of off the shelf in a turnkey fashion, you can start to incorporate them very, very early in your development, which means the game itself is really built around those services from the ground up, which is a much more cohesive and, and integral experience. You know, as, a, as, a, as a small example, you know, Bethesda is launching uh, Doom Eternal tomorrow and we're working with them to power some of the services for, for that game. And we've been working with them for a very long time now. So when that game ships, it's using a lot of services powered by Microsoft that are going to be pretty, pretty compelling. Jesse, is there anything else that you're seeing with developers that are, are using online services differently today than we did 10 years ago? I mean, primarily, it's kind of what I said earlier, which is um, they're just getting earlier feedback from customers and more frequent feedback from actually the, the player base. And that's enabling them to make better decisions. You don't have to project out what content, you know, 50 hours into the game or they're going to need a year from now because what's going to happen is you're going to set up a system so that you can actually get that data, get your, your feedback uh, in a structured way um, combined with what you're hearing from players like in forums with what they're, how they're using the game to make better decisions about which content you're going to use, which extends the life of your game. And that process, like um, someone else mentioned, starts literally at day one now when you're saying, hey, should we use this theme, that theme, this art style, that art style? You can start actually getting a pulse of your players super early and that's actually really helpful. And I think it will impact the, the, the number of games that are going to be viable, which is positive for developers and players. Uh, James Gortzman, do you have an example of how game studios are using these services today? And I know you just mentioned Bethesda, but is there any other examples you have? Yeah, I mean, you know, our own first party studios are, are fantastic early adopters. We talked about Sea of Thieves. I think Sea of Thieves is a great example where they started uh, with one kind of game experience and they've been actually sort of learning and adapting the live ops mentality themselves over the course of that game being live. So if you look at Sea of Thieves today, uh, it's very different than when it launched a year, you know, two years ago. They have way more live events now. They have way more uh, content updates. Uh, they've taken a more iterative approach to the, the, the kind of weekly cycle. Uh, whereas in the beginning, I think they still had more of a waterfall model of you know, longer gaps of time between, between their big updates. Uh, I, I keep talking about the, the Flight Simulator game. To me, that is the perfect example of a true 
cloud powered game now where we've taken our existing flight simulator, which is a well-known beloved legacy product from Microsoft. Uh, and now we've coupled it with, with not just the cloud, but like the cloud on steroids. You know, we're taking satellite data and machine learning and AI techniques. And that is a game that literally could not exist without the ability to stream content off the cloud in real time. The game's gonna have real time weather conditions. The game's gonna have real time updates based on, on, on the world changing. Uh, and I can't wait to play that. That's that's one of, that's the top of my kind of must play list. And I've been working closely with the studio building it. Super excited to see that come out. Uh, James Trot, I kind of want to ask you the same question, but a little bit differently. Are there any games that are using these online services that surprised you that you wouldn't think they'd be able to use them in their development process? Yeah, I spent a lot of time over the last year talking to a lot of our ID at Xbox partners, small studios that are building independent games uh, uh, with Microsoft for Xbox and other platforms. And I'm always blown away by the variety and the kind of ingenious ways they find to use our services. One of the early questions that I used to get a lot was, well, OK, I, I get it. Microsoft has this game stack, but but what does it cost? And across the stack, especially for the small developer or just starting out to get those signals and start trying these things out, the answer is free. Uh, Azure has tons of free services. Azure DevOps, GitHub, GitHub have free offerings. PlayFab has a free offering. You're able to get in and try these things at minimal to no cost. And they're able to do incredible things with, with a very, very small amount. Things like managing, uh, managing currencies, doing uh, digital delivery of like skins, assets, cosmetics, uh, DLC. You can do a huge amount with very little if you're prepared to put in the dev time. And as we move forward, I think we're just going to see more and more of that as indie devs realize that these services are for them too. They can get the kind of insights that Jesse's talking about. You don't have to be a sea of thieves to understand how your players are using your game. And you can leverage the cloud to actually offset a huge amount of what used to be the constant update cycle cost of having to ship new builds just by doing dynamic content generation and putting a lot of your assets into a cloud or a cloud service or a gaming specific service like PlayFab. Jesse, anything you want to add there? Uh, I think that sums it up pretty well. Um, <laughs> you know, I think we've hit all the high points. Fantastic. Uh, well, Jesse, how many of these Microsoft's 15 game studios are currently using online services? Oh, gosh. I would imagine all of them, although I don't know that I've had the chance to meet with all of them yet. But um, it's supposed, I mean, it's supposed to all of them. Yeah. I, I, it's got to be all of them, right? In some way. Don't. Yeah. So if they have achievements, at least they're using online services. Yeah. That is, that's an incredible. Uh, James Gortzman, yesterday, we, when we were talking about our live ops and how does that integrate with other online services that we're, we're talking about here? Because live ops and online services aren't the same thing. So how do they integrate together? Yeah, I mean, I mean, I mean, live ops is actually more of a set of cultural practices and design practices that a team goes through. That's how I think of it. So, you know, good modern teams practice live ops as a way of keeping a game relevant and fresh and, and boosting player engagement. To do live ops effectively, you need online services. You need to have live games that have, you know, player to player communication and, and other such gameplay. You need to have the ability to update the game and make changes. The ability to store information about your players and learn about them and, and personalize experiences. The ability to host communities and the ability to uh, uh, let your players engage with each other. And then the ability to make to run events and to make changes uh, uh, and, and test out and run experiments. You know, collectively, this plus others is sort of the, the, the set of practices we call live ops. Uh, Christina, kind of same question to you between live ops and online services. Clearly not. Is there one that's more important than the other? Should developers be focusing on both of them? Well, I think it's like what James said. You can't really have live ops without live services. Um, so you need to build those live services or, or get the you know play fab to help you with those live services. And then you'll be able to practice the culture of live ops. Um, but it's important to kind of start both at the same time. You can't start your live services and then transition to a, a culture of live ops. You, once you've decided that you're going to make a live game and use these live services, you have to start that culture of live ops then, um, because that's a lot of uh, difficulty that developers run into is changing that mentality from the box product to a live game to live ops. Uh, we actually got a question from our Discord. How do they envision game studios should evolve to best take advantage of advances in service technology? And it's a culture could... shift. I mean, I'll, I'll start with the culture, which is which is starting to say, you know, because we've seen this. We've seen traditional studios have this model where it starts with designers, they come with the design, they build it, they ship it, you know, two years later, and then they move on to a sequel. 
right? That's that's over and done. And and studios that are starting to adopt the live ops mentality, starting with a culture shift that says we're going to be shipping new content every couple of weeks, you know, and start to build their studio around that. So so and and we're going to be learning and engaging with our player base to do so. So we're going to start using analytics and and looking at player behavior and start to and 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 often staffing teams differently. So you no longer have just your art team and your design team and your coding team. Now you have a live ops team and you often have a marketing team. <clears throat> It is not just what the publisher does, but it's an integral part of your studio. And so how you staff and how you, you organize your studio uh, itself is changing. I think, I was going to say also to add, build on what James is saying, um, the idea that the role of the PM and the designer um, greatly sort of change or, or evolve in this, in this model because, um, like I said, with an additional bit of cost, there's also there's an additional bit of cost with each additional bit of engagement. And so designing your game to be either service-based where you need to have a revenue stream that matches the ongoing cost of operating it um, needs to be designed in from the beginning. It's it's not just like designing a box retail game that you get 60 bucks for and that's it. Um, you have to be very careful about your economy. I think the other thing to consider is if there's player-to-player -player value exchange in your game, um, you have a whole set of other concerns to think about. Um, things like money laundering, right? Um, there's a whole series of things that can now happen um, with an online game that just weren't concerns when you were just playing it by yourself on a console. No, I, I remember uh, the launch of Diablo 3, the auction house there created quite a stir with people essentially doing what you're, you're saying there. Yeah. Uh, James, James Trott, have we seen anything else like that in the evolution of, of online services? I mean, we've seen a lot of interesting kind of abuses and uh, kind of interesting workarounds. As we move to streamed content, one of the things that it actually becomes really hard to do is influence the system, cheat, uh, ex exploit bugs, because everything is happening on the server side. There's been this rule in services development for games for a long time, don't trust the client. We never trust what is happening on the end device. Well, in the streamed gaming world, the only thing coming from the device is the input, and everything else is coming from an online service down to it. So there are significant advantages with live ops, you're actually able to watch a huge amount of data flow past. And so when it comes to something like an economy, an auction house, or where money laundering or other illicit activity might be going on, you're going to see certain behaviors and you can instrument and detect that with a very low barrier to entry. People kind of get uh, get into this mindset of, oh, that must be very difficult to do. And services like PlayFab have taken a lot of the hard work out to the point that this is, this is a very kind of point-and-click, easy-to-adopt notion to protect yourself. There's no need to be intimidated by any of these things. James Gortzman, James Trott, Jesse, Christina, thank you guys so much for joining me here. This was a, a great conversation. And if you guys are just joining us right now, do not worry. You're going to be able to catch the VOD of this on our YouTube channel later on. I do want to thank everyone here. And, of course, thank you guys in our Discord channel asking these incredible questions. But now it's time to head on over to Rakari with a little more from you guys. All right, I'm back in my corner, right where I belong. Now, before we get to our first Indie Dev Showcase of the show, a reminder that we've got literally a metric ton of technical content on YouTube for you that's on demand, available right now. Now, that content has things from teams like Turn 10. Yesterday, if you caught, Dan Greenwald from Turn 10 joined us to talk all things Forza. You can also check out Shay Goldenberg's talk on Forza Monthly to see how live streaming can enhance your engagement with your players. Not to be outdone, David Paris from Playground Games talked about how they improved the stability of their little driving simulator with From Zero to 1000, a test-driven approach to tools development. Head on over to aka.ms slash GameStack On Demand for the full rundown. All right, we've got more great games to talk about. Industry-leading 3D content optimization from our friends at SimplyGon. They'll be showing how their new Python API, excuse me, can be used together with the Adobe Substance Automation Toolkit to create smooth texturing pipelines. You don't want to miss out on this opportunity to learn from the masters at SimplyGon. All right, now we heard from the team at In, In Exile earlier today, and now we've got ourselves one more bonus feature. Check it out. You can play test a level, kind of. And, and like in isolation, I'm gonna get a debug party that's set to level 15. I'm gonna go jump into this thing. That kind of works. 
but it's really hard to really tell outside of the context of the full game. Like if every single encounter was nail biting, like a really strategic challenge that can actually have a lot of player fatigue. Like if everything pushes me to my total brink and like my party almost dies in every combat while any one individual combat, you'd be like, oh man, that was really good. That was crisp. Mwah. But then in the context of the full game, if I had to fight 25 of those in the first couple of hours, that's exhausting. And, and there's a little bit of power fantasy too. Like in this fight, I actually want you to feel powerful. You are you are a desert ranger, you're a badass, you're a special operator, you're highly trained. I want you to smoke this group. And like narratively, it's gonna feel really good. We want you to like feel powerful and then we wanna like slowly challenge you, challenge you. You hit a peak, you fight a boss, that boss gives you a really badass weapon and then whoo, now you get to like coast down because now I have a, a, a frozen ferret rocket launcher um, and I'm just, the next like five combats, I'm just dusting with this new weapon and I feel like a badass and then all of a sudden now enemies start compensating and I start hitting some friction and then we build up again. All right, welcome to GameStack Live. Now, I know you were looking forward to showing off your game at GDC, um, but tell us about, well, I guess we're gonna welcome our guest here, uh, Clayton. Clayton, are you there? All yes, right. I am. Huh? How are you? I'm doing fine, how are you? I am doing great now that you're here, of course. Uh, thanks so much for joining us in our virtual setting here. Um, now, let's talk a bit about your game. Uh, I know you were looking forward to showing it off at GDC. Of course, circumstances didn't allow for that, but tell us a bit about Bartlow's Dread Machine. Uh, yeah, um, it, it's um, it's uh, this idea uh, for a game that I had actually years ago. And it's one of those things that, I, you know, you always have these things kind of like percolating in the back of your mind. Uh, things you um, maybe sort of like iterate on a little bit over the years. And um, this is one of those, you know, this is something that maybe, gosh, over 10 years ago, um, I had this thought that, hey, what would a video game be like if someone created it over 100 years ago and they made it all out of tin with mechanical stuff? So um, I started thinking about that, but not you know not just a shooting arcade thing, but the idea that it's like a real game. It has characters in it. They have upgradable weapons. They have a story that goes on this sort of adventure across all kinds of cool locations. And then you know again, what would that be like if it was in this sort of giant improbable um, device that someone made? And so you know after kind of thinking about it and cogitating and doing a little bit of concept work, you know, and I kept tucking it away, kind of putting it in the back of my mind. Um, uh, about, about three years ago, I uh, published a game on ID at Xbox, which was the Voodoo Vince remaster. And I think that's where I finally made this connection that, oh, I, I could just make this game and put it out on ID at Xbox. So, um, you know, I partnered with um, a studio called Tribe Toy that's um, here in the, the Northwest sort of Seattle area. And so as sort of like my passion project, we've been working on it for, gosh, about a year now. And um, we're, it's uh, well well underway and we're, we're out later this summer. Yeah, I'm very excited. I actually watched the uh, the trailer, the announced trailer from a little bit ago, and I'm, I wanna dive into the story. You kind of brought it up a bit um, of what would it be like if a video game was created a long time ago. It, there's also an interesting sure. twist that was in the trailer of like the people who played it got injured. Uh, can you dive yes. into a bit more of what all of that means? Yeah, um, so the, the creator of the game uh, was uh, this, this uh, person I created named Arthur Harrington Bartlow. And Bartlow, of course, was like one of those like misguided people who had the best of intentions. That's his photo over my shoulder. Oh, OK. There you go. Yeah, sorry, just beating on everything. Oh, no worries. Here. No so, worries. Great. Yeah, this, this is my great little studio. So, you know, <laughs> I dig, I dig it. Uh, anyway, uh, Bartlow creates this machine and he, of course, spends everything he has creating it. He thinks it's going to be this amazing success because it's just like nothing anyone's ever seen before. But, yeah, it's 1907. So they used live ammunition and live explosives and things like that. So, um, of course, everyone's getting getting injured. And that's also where it got its name. You know, um, it was originally Bartlow's Machine of Wonders. And then uh, it became known as Bartlow's Dread Machine. And of course, he, he lost everything he had. There was a catastrophic fire. And then the the notion is that um, my team and I um, at Tribe Toy have been kind of painstakingly recreating this thing from old blueprints and, and documents and things and things like that. Um, so yeah, that's and that's you know the uh, the notion of what we we have going on there. 
Awesome. And we're going to get into the premise of the game in just a bit, but I, I would love if you could describe the play style of the game because um, that's something that sure. really caught my eye, and I think that's something that's really indicative of a lot of ID at Xbox games. Yeah, it's, um, uh, it is, uh, in essence, a classic arcade game. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a twin stick shooter with single player and co-op modes. And um, couch co-op was super, super important to us because, you know, I, I love, love the games that have allowed me to sit with a friend or a family member and just, you know, play a, a cool game or go on an adventure together. And uh, that's uh, that's um, one thing that we thought was super important, like thinking back on things like, you know, Castle Crashers or, um, you know, uh, any, any number of other cool games, even Cuphead, you know, that that allow people to sort of like just get together and pick up a couple controllers and just play something just splashy and fun and quick. Yeah, so, and um, you're coming into the ID at Xbox group with a unique perspective and not just as a partner, but with a deep well of experience in the gaming industry. Um, now, going back to the creation of, of Bartlow's Dread Machine, um, how important is it for you to have a unique um, premise for a game, especially when it's an independent, like ID at Xbox game? I, it's really good to have something that, that makes you stand out. You know, in, in this case, we wanted super accessible gameplay, but the look and style is, is something that we think really distinguishes the game. There's, there aren't a lot of things out there that just have this sort of purely mechanical aesthetic where everything's got, you know, gears and wires and struts. Everything sort of has this sort of physical justification. Um, I mean, when, when you get under the hood of the gameplay, um, we took, I mean, if you were to think of it as a Robotron meets Pac-Man, there's, there are little tracks you guide your character along. You have choice and you have movement. But you're also playing this basically a, a you know a twin stick shoot. So you know you're you're just you know rotating your your, your sticks and you're, you're you're blasting away at the enemies. Um, so we wanted to make the gameplay super super accessible. Anyone can just pick up a controller, have a good time. Um, but the little twist beyond that is the fact that the game is still three dimensional, even though it's sort of like two D gameplay. We've tilted it into a box. So even though you're playing what you might think of as like an old school like Robotron game when you tag an enemy that's like opposite corner from like another spot, there is skill. You actually have to like really think about those shots and you really have to choose things carefully. And then the fact that it's three dimensional means you get a little bit of thing, you get the strategic stuff like cover. You, know, you there's objects in the world that you can use to sort of duck behind or hide, but everything's also destructible, including the backdrops. I mean, everything in the game is made of tin. You, you can ultimately kind of lay waste to not only the enemies, but all the, all the scenery and things you see around you in the, in the game. So, yeah, I mean, we, we thought that would be a, a distinguishing thing that would really make this sort of, we call it delightful destruction. And, and it was a thing that we thought would really help the game stand out. I love it. I mean, the look is so unique. And again, going back to that point of seeing ID at Xbox games uh, and just independent game development in general, we're seeing a lot of really cool ideas. And so I'm curious in this world of, of maybe, uh, you know, we have the power of, you know, Xbox Series X. We saw PlayStation 5, some stuff about that today. Um, what are you like? What do you see independent game development as it stands to like these blockbuster games that are using the huge power of these consoles? And like, where do you see those games like in that space? I mean, I, I think it's a it's a big play field with a lot of room for everybody, obviously. And I love gigantic AAA games. But I do think the indie space is where uh, you can try a new a new interesting idea. You can try something that you always wanted to try or like with this, something that I just wanted to make for years. You find some like minded people who maybe you think, yeah, that's a cool idea. Let's go make that. And I think without taking you know, crazy amounts of risk, you know, like, like Bartlow when he destroyed everybody, <laughs> you, you can try that. You can try things that are maybe a little different, a little more daring, a little more, um, you know, strange if, if, if you will. And, and I do think that that is where a lot of the great things do bubble up into tomorrow's triple a games. I think where, um, this, this test lab where everyone can just sort of throw together some stuff and iterate quickly and, and, and be bold and be daring with their ideas is, is one thing you can, you can do, I think very effectively with, with a small team, uh, especially thanks to the sorts of tools and technology that are available now. I think uh, any, anybody can basically make a game who really wants to. Yeah, let's. I guess let's talk about those tools. You know, talking about you know independent game development. I think there's a allowance for maybe more freedom in what you're trying to do, uh, and and part of that is being able to partner with ID at Xbox. Now, do you have any advice for devs who are looking to partner with ID at Xbox? And what was your uh, experience like using utilizing GameStack? Um, you know, I, I, we haven't used a lot of, of GameStack yet. That's our, the new and coming thing, and our game's not out until late summer. So we're still looking at the sort of technology that we're incorporating, you know, into um, our development process. I mean, we have a lot of our content done, but um, the 
the question though about like what what I would advise someone who wants to do like you know an ID game is you know it's uh, part of it's the clarity of, of what you want to do. I'd like if you if you know what you want to do and you know who it's for and you kind of have this idea that you you know you want to again try something out that you think would be really cool and interesting. If you have um, compatriots who you can enlist to to work with you, really all you need is to um, set up what amounts to like a business, and that can be um, pretty casual. I mean, you can you can usually just set those up depending on where you live online and based and then there's an online application for ID anybody. Um, who lines up the right resources and and signs up for that um, has a shot. Can, can can make a game and it can be on all these amazing consoles, you know, uh, all over the world. So it's um, uh, it, I guess to me it's it's more about just kind of like uh, having having that vision, being able to drive forward forward with it, and and being able to share sort of like that that essential DNA of of what it is you are doing with the people you're working with. Yeah, and so I'm, I'm kind of a, to dovetail off that question. Um, what has been some of your key learnings? Um, you know, again, everyone watching or a lot of people watching this may be trying to develop a game for the first time. Um, what are some other key learnings that you would share with them to to really get them started? Yeah, I, th I think um, again, it, it it starts with that thing I was calling the DNA, the the basic idea. Um, I think that's that's sort of like the, the sort of like the razor you use when you are making choices because you know um, I've, I've worked on big budget games and you know when you you can go down various rabbit holes you can you can um, end up um, spending a lot of time on on like really complex processes or or, or if you um, it's I guess I guess what what I'm saying is um, con control your know your scope and costs you know know what it is you're trying to do don't try to go too far beyond that I mean it's it's a it's possible to you know um put together things and get that magical um combination of, of gameplay and technology that, that, that everyone says hey cool but um it's it's also very easy to overscope. it's easy to be overly ambitious it's um a thing where i think if you just again keep your eye on what that vision you have for that for that end you know experience for your players um that that will help you really kind of steer things correctly and, and when again when you have a small team it's, it's easier to do the communication is easier everyone's much closer to the to the game and the content and the processes so um i, I guess that's my my main advice is to just you know it's just you know you know watch your step you know um, design smart design carefully yeah, that focus and that scope is super important. Again, especially when you have uh, a small team, perhaps you're kind of forced to do that in, in some ways. Um, now, you, uh, I would love, you know, your experience. You have a very unique experience and background in the gaming industry, uh, and maybe that's sort of also inspirational. Can you tell us a little bit about where you are as far as independent game development and just Xbox, anything that you can share with us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, uh, my. My job, actually, my role is uh, I'm a creative director in uh, Xbox Studios uh, Publishing. So, um, I mean, part of what I do is is work with the external studios that are creating products for for Xbox. Um, but I go home and I work on games. You know, it's 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 just this passion of mine to still create things and and make things because I feel like that helps me do what I do, and, and that is to really understand, um, you know, the processes of making a game, what a team goes through, the psychology of, of what we do. I, I think it's very easy to get up onto a pulpit and and, and make speeches, like I'm doing right now, <laughs> but it's, um, uh, I, I see that as kind of as all being parts of a whole, though. You know, I, I, I will never stop wanting to make things and, and to be able to follow um, maybe a vision for an idea, and again, this is a, again it's such a tremendous outlet. It's such a tremendous platform for for doing just that. Yeah, and you, you say it's a speech, but I think a lot of people are you want to hear from that. You know, they want they want the uh, opportunity. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, they want the That's opportunity. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. They want the opportunity to kind of learn from people who've been doing it for quite some time and whose main job it is. And so, you know, just to circle it back to to Bartlow's Dread Machine, um, where can people yeah. learn more about the game? And where can they find it? Oh, um, yeah, you can just go to um, www.dreadmachine.com. Uh, That's the main sort of landing page. So there are links there to, um, there's the trailer, there's screenshots and some stuff you can look at there. Um, also links to um, the Tribe Toy site. They're, they're a really talented group of developers, super passionate about um, what they are doing. Uh, and yeah, that's um That'd be the main place to go. I'm looking forward to the game, Summer 2020. I'm telling you, that trailer caught me. And um, so I really appreciate your insights on one, making an original idea and also like staying in scope, staying focused. Uh, Clayton, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much for stopping by. Well, thanks. Really appreciate it. Really awesome being here. Absolutely.
Thank you so much. And now from an example of what GameStack can do for indie titles to two people who play them. Kelly Ricari, tell me what you got. Malik, I just got to say, first of all, what an outro you threw right there. Oh, Way to make people you. feel welcome. Way to make you. us feel welcome, too. And of yes, course. we do play. We do play our indie games. Yeah, Ooh. without a doubt. I think I've played through Stardew Valley like four or five times now. Four or five? Yeah. What did you I, think not, after the third? That's what I want to know. Well, you, the multiplayer got added, and they keep doing the updates, and now you can date Shane. Uh, but this seems to be just me talking about myself. What about you? What indie games do you like? You know what's my favorite one? Hashtag IDARB. That's the one from back in the day. Which it was a little 8-bit hashtag IDARB. Yes, it draws a red box, I believe is what it ended up being called. Imagine like a, a 2D almost soccer game with, ah, oh, there was this old sludge bit that you're running around controlling a little pixel that is I think you're making this up. Ball. I kid you not, it is out there. And as soon as we get our prompter back up to speed, we'll get you guys rolling with the rest of the show because I see somebody who's getting set for our next talk and it'll be a good time. But if you're at home and you're watching, I wanna remind you guys, hop into Discord, let us know your thoughts, your questions. The show's going on and we're having a ton of fun with it. We are. And I still laugh that all this came together last minute. So we hope you're enjoying it too. And if you are, jump into Discord, let us know how it's going. Again, this event is called GameStack Live because we were all about talking GameStack. We had that bit earlier. Now, yesterday we brought you through some of the tools and solutions that Microsoft has brought together for game development under one family, the GameStack family of solutions. Robust tools and solutions like GameStack deserve much more time than we have to showcase them from yesterday and today, which is why we've created GameStack.com, an online resource to help you learn everything you need to know about GameStack. Whether you're looking for an out-of-the-box full experience or looking to engage in just one or two tools from the pack, GameStack has something for every kind of game and every development goal. And remember, we're in Discord talking all things uh, tech with our tech experts right now. Speaking of goals, next-gen console gaming has been a goal for many of us in the last few months and many more going forward. All right, this is it. This is the moment I've been waiting for Oof. to speak about the future of console gaming. Let's send it over to Brian with more from Project X Cloud and Xbox Series X. Awesome, thanks Chief, I'll take it from here. All right, uh, thanks Kelly, thanks Rikari. I have the pleasure of helping moderate this incredible panel today. Uh, so let's introduce our players to you. First up, we have Catherine Gluckstein, who is the GM of Project X Cloud, responsible for product and strategy. Then we're gonna have Jason Ronald, the Director of Program Management for the Xbox platform. We've got Rachel Card, Senior Director of Program Management for Microsoft Gaming. And rounding things out is going to be Chris Novak, partner and head of Xbox Design Studio. Everyone, welcome. <laughs> cool. Can we hear everybody? Are you guys on, on the phone? Can we hear us yep. a little hey, say Brian. hello? Yep, we're yeah. here. Thanks yes. for having us. Hey, Brian. Hi, everybody. Okay, so got a couple ground rules today. Um, again, everybody, we're doing this live, so this is going to be a lot of fun. Um, but as ground rules, just because we have everybody that is going to be on picture but no video, um, we're going to do a little bit of listening actions here. So I'm going to be asking questions, and I'm going to try and ask a question directly to a person. So when you guys get that, um, just give a second pause so we can make sure that we're not speaking over each other, but we're going to do the best we can. So. With that, before we get into the meat of the topics, I want to give some context as to why each of you were chosen to be with us today. Catherine, let's start with you. Before xCloud, you served as Phil Spencer's chief of staff, bringing with you more than 20 years of product experience. How has that prepared you to step into this leadership role? So, so firstly, Brian, I just want to say um, I wish I could be there in person. But as you know, all our worlds have been turned upside down by this uh, this crazy virus. And in fact, I've got two kids in another room doing homeschooling and my husband on meetings elsewhere. So I'm just fingers crossed my Internet's going to stand up. But but absolutely. What, what prepared me for this role? So, you know, really, I've spent the last 20 years building a career that has sort of harnessed technology to evolve the distribution, consumption and business models for content. And then about three years ago, I, as you rightly said, I joined Xbox as Phil Spencer's chief of staff. And I have to say, 
That was an incredible experience. I mean, Phil, as we know, is one of gaming's greats. He might blush if I say that, but it's, uh, but, you know, to have the experience to learn about gaming, you know, alongside him was just gave me, you know, incredible insight into where this business is going. And as you know, Brian, we spent a lot of time looking to evolve the Xbox strategy during that period. It was where we stated our goal was to reach the two billion gamers on the planet. And we defined our framework as the three C's, the content, community and cloud. And, you know, as you can see, I'm lucky enough now to get to execute this strategy with an amazing team, you know, really get to execute on that third C, the cloud strategy. So couldn't feel luckier. Awesome, awesome. Thank you, Catherine. Jason, let's go to you. You were part of the core team on Xbox Series X. And before that, you were with the Xbox Advanced Technology Group and Xbox Game Studios. Now you've had a front row seat to much of the evolution happening in the industry. How has that influenced the way that you lead teams around Xbox Series X? Thanks, Brian. Uh, you know, really, this is one of the most exciting times in my long history in the game industry with the introduction of like new disruptive technologies, innovative game design and just totally new ways to engage with players. So I think first and foremost, it's really about listening to our customers. And when I say customers, I mean both gamers and developers. The voice of the development community is absolutely critical to everything that we do here in, at Team Xbox. And it really kind of shapes where we take the technology and the platforms that we deliver. And as a platform builder and designer, our role is really to empower developers to deliver on their creative visions, but by providing them with the best hardware, software, and development tools. Mm. And we really want the technology to fade away for both developers and players so that gamers have the most amazing and immersive experience on whatever device they choose to play on. Mm. That's awesome. Rachel, let's go over to you. You have experience working with the governor of South Carolina, and you also led an indie video game studio. How has your background given you maybe a unique perspective as the product lead for Xbox Series X? Hey, Brian, thanks for that. Um, yeah, so I have a really unique background. And first, I think I would just like to acknowledge I feel very, very fortunate for the experiences that I've had, both in my education and in my professional roles. Um, the red thread kind of across all those is that I've had the honor to work with really great people and do really great things. Um, where when I worked with the indie game studio, when we formed that, it was really about building, you know, amazing experiences for gamers um, and really digging deep to understand what would delight them and what experiences they would love. Um, it was also about getting sold on the value of entrepreneurial spirit and agility um, and those skills I bring with me. Yeah. Um, to when I worked with the governor, um, that was really humbling. It was an awesome experience. You know, we were on a personal mission, both of us, to increase job opportunities, to help you know, a really difficult public education system in our beloved home state. Mm. Um, and to my current role now, you know, at Microsoft, it's our mission to strive to empower every person and every organization on the planet. And I think we're really fortunate to be in a position to help do that. And so for me, when I think about product, I'm grateful for my experiences, but really I'm most grateful for all of my team's experiences because I think we all have very individual unique experiences that shape the products we build. Mm. These products are a reflection of the team that build them. Mm. And we believe that in our core. Mm. That's good, that's good. Now, Chris, let's finish with you real quick. You are a game designer by trade with over 25 years experience in the industry. Now you've shipped titles like Forza Motorsport, Project Gotham Racing, Crackdown, I could go on. For those unfamiliar with the role of design and product development, would you mind elaborating a little bit? Sure, happy to. Um, really, there's, there's two primary roles. One is for the customer, and that is purely to help galvanize a team to deliver something which is unexpectedly fun. And I use those words unexpectedly fun very purposely, because um, frankly, when you're, when you're in an entertainment industry and you're making a game or you're playing that game, it's very challenging to you know, beat the expectation that somebody has when they expect it to be fun. And so you're really trying to do something that delivers that little bit of extra unexpected fun where it makes people talk and they talk about your game. They're like, hey, wait, they did what? Oh, I wouldn't have expected they do that. I need to try that out. And it's really that, that last little bit of getting them something which they didn't expect, right? Like if you're going to go drive a Ferrari, you're going to expect to be fast, but you're not going to expect the guy next to you to you know, hit the button that busts out the booster rockets on it. And that's going to be the thing that you remember because you weren't expecting it, right? You were expecting it to be great. You're expecting it to be fast, 
But those booster rockets were the thing that took it over the top. And that's really what you're trying to do on the game, trying to take that journey, that player on a journey and make them feel something. Um, and the second role for design really amongst the team, you know, it's really regarded as the discipline that helps tie everything together into something pure, something very focused. Because um, there, are, there are times when, hey, there might be business questions at hand or, or tech questions or just design questions themselves. Um, and designers are really the ones um, pinned to, hey, here's where this can go. Here's that vision. Here's if this thing didn't go right. Here's how we can pivot and still deliver an ex excellent customer experience. And in the end, whether you're an audio designer or game designer, combat designer, or UX designer, there's a bunch of different flavors. Your job is to deliver something focused, mm. pure, and that takes the player on a journey and makes them feel something. Mm. That's good. I feel like whenever I see design, we have this conversation all the time in the office, Chris. It's like good products start with good design. So I just I love having you on the panel. I think this is going to be a great conversation. So let's get started. Let's get at this. I know you all have been waiting for this. Jason, let's kick off with you. There was some big news this week on Xbox Series X. Can you tell us how the technical advances allow developers to unlock new and innovative gaming experiences? Absolutely. You know, this has been a really exciting week for the team. The team's been working really hard on Xbox Series X since 2016. And to finally be able to actually share some of the details of what we've been working on has definitely been a highlight for all of us. Um, and, you know, as you mentioned on Monday, we shared many of the details of our next generation console. And it's really about uh, enabling transformative gaming experiences that we've never seen in the living room. You know, in, in the early days of the planning process, uh, the design of the Xbox Series X was really uh, directly influenced by three key principles. Like I mentioned before, first and foremost is developer and gamer feedback. When I was leading the Xbox Advanced Technology Group, you know, the team worked closely with developers all across the world, making everything from the industry's best blockbusters to competitive esports titles to extremely innovative ideas in game design uh, coming from some of the industry's best independent creators. And we really listened, learned, and helped them overcome the technology barriers that were really limiting their aspirations for the games that they were creating, whether that was in hardware, software, or even the developer tools that we provide. And then I think another key aspect of it as well is gamers are also demanding higher and more stable frame rates. So we challenge ourselves to not only build a system that could uh, reliably deliver high quality 4K game experiences at 60 frames a second, but we challenge ourselves to go even further and to deliver frame rates up to 120 frames a second, frame rates that historically you never thought were possible in the living room. Uh, you know, so it was really about kind of pushing those boundaries and really understanding what developers and gamers were really looking for in a next generation console. And then the second one is just really looking at the ad ad innovations in technology with an eye towards the future. You know, everything from advancements in CPU performance, more efficient usage of GPU, uh, next generation graphics innovation and capabilities, things like hardware accelerated ray tracing or variable rate shading or mesh shaders. It's really about giving developers new kinds of tools to really build those rich uh, dynamic worlds that players like to spend time in. And another great example of that is with the current generation, we're basically at the upper bounds of what's possible with a traditional rotational drive technology. Mm. And it was really constraining the game design uh, that developers were having where they'd have to arbitrarily funnel players through different tunnels or pathways, or you know, you'd have a fast travel system where it'd take a super long time to teleport from one side of the map to another. So, you know, with these insights, it was very clear that we would need to invest in things like SSD level IO performance or a revolutionary new uh, architecture to make it easier for game developers and game engines to stream assets in real time from the storage solution into the memory and the CPU and the GPU so that you can get that real rich, high fidelity, dynamic living world uh, that players expect. And then I think the final principle or the final thing that we really thought about in the very early days was when you design a new console hardware platform, you're really setting the direction for gaming and game development for the next seven to 10 years. So you really have to have a solid vision as to where you see game development going uh, and the kinds of gaming experiences that players want to have. So as we looked into the future with new innovations like Project X Cloud and game streaming, 
we knew we had an opportunity to make key decisions in the design of the system that would could open up brand new possibilities for developers. Hmm. And like one thing that we learned very early on uh, as we started working closely with the Azure team is some of the same challenges that we have in delivering a high performance game console in your living room are the same kinds of challenges that we have in the data center. Things such as delivering high performance for gaming workloads while minimizing power consumption and thermal management. And having that vision of a future really helped shape how we design our custom SOC that's powering the Xbox Series X and the overall system architecture so that we could make sure that we're providing a common and consistent hardware, software, and development platform that makes it easier for developers to bring the games that they're developing today on console and PC into the cloud in the future. And many of the technologies that we're innovating and incubating with the Xbox Series X are being brought to PC and brought to Project X Cloud. And it's because we designed the system with the future in mind mm -hmm. from the very outset of the program. Wow. Yeah, Jason, this is, this is blowing my mind. Like having worked on the team for a while and, and kind of getting a chance to see um, what this thing looks like in person is kind of like shocking me right now. This is actually the first time I've, I've actually kind of, I can't touch it. My fingerprints will get on it. It's one of those things like, this is amazing. I, I geek out about this all the time. And you said something that has really just like blown my mind a bit, which is like, this is like one of the first times we've built the console thinking about where the next generation, the next iteration, the next paradigm shift in game development is really going. And you talk about the cloud. Can you touch a bit on the, the role that the cloud plays as you're thinking about the development of Xbox Series X? Sure. So, you know, there's certain scenarios, you know, this is a custom SOC. This is a custom architecture uh, that we've designed from the ground up to make sure that we're delivering that high fidelity gaming experience. But as you think about things like the cloud and what we're doing with Project X Cloud, you know, there's certain things that, uh, for example, virtualizing the display controller, as an example. If we're just designing the system in such a way to make uh, only a high performing gaming console, that's an investment that you wouldn't make or it's a design decision you wouldn't really think about. But you only really get a one chance to make those decisions, and it's when you're designing the chip, when you're designing the overall system architecture. So as we think about how developers are going to take their games and move them to, into the cloud or how they're going to be developing games in the cloud in the future, we knew we needed to invest in certain key technological investments from day one to make sure that we're providing a clear path for developers so that developers don't actually have to go and like significantly alter their game or rewrite their game from scratch. We want to provide kind of a path as game streaming becomes much more, much more prevalent and accessible. And ultimately, it's really about empowering developers to reach customers all across the world, whether they choose to own a console, they choose to play on a PC, or maybe streaming is going to be their primary experience. We want to provide that easy path for developers. There's something you said. I have one more follow-up question on this, and this is something that like, a lot of teams, a lot of people that may be watching this maybe just don't know, is the lead time that it takes in order to, to put together a, a console. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about, like, how, you mentioned making technology decisions of, of what the hardware is going to be in this box. It's not like, oh, it's, it's two months from launch, let's just put this thing in there. Like, there's a, there's a whole process to that thinking. Can, can you elaborate just a little bit on, on just some of the work that it takes to kind of think through where this is gonna be in time? Sure. You know, we really started the development of Xbox Series X in 2016, before we had even released the Xbox One X. So to your point on lead times, you know, it's multiple years of investigation, of prototyping, of trying to figure out where the technology roadmap's going, understanding from developers where, what their game design aspirations are. You know, there's entire new genres of games or new kinds of game experiences that, you know, have come up in the last two to three years. So a lot of it is really kind of that partnership with our development partners, both at Xbox Game Studios as well as the best creators all across the industry, but it's also making sure that we have a clear vision of where do we see gaming going as, as Team Xbox. And once again, you know, our goal is to get, uh, Catherine mentioned earlier, you know, really reaching out to those 2 billion gamers all across the world. So it's like, how do we make it as easy as possible? And what are the investments that we need to be making so that customers all across the world can have the same great gaming experience that those of us who grew up gaming on consoles 
know and love today and do it in such a way that makes it easy for developers. Mm, that's good. I think it's a perfect segue as well. Um, let's dig into the next bit of this. We want to talk a little bit about Project X Cloud. And Catherine, I'm going to bring this next question to you. Would you mind talking us through the approach of Microsoft bringing Project X Cloud to market? And, and before you jump in, I actually am going to get everybody follow me, follow me on the camera. This is going to be fun. We're doing this in real time. I have a server blade over here from Project X Cloud that I also was so excited when I heard this was going to be here. This is an actual Project X Cloud server blade that is in the footprints of Azure at the global data center level. And it is so cool to take a look at the guts of this thing because, wow, like the tech that went into this, the making of this is, is unbelievably impressive. Catherine, back to the question. Walk us through Microsoft's approach in bringing xCloud to market. Yeah, no, absolutely. Brian, when you just took off there, I had no idea where you were going. <laughs> I was just like, well, where, where's he going now? But you're seeing our blade. And I mean, it is so cool. And it is, you know, Rachel said it earlier, our products are testament to the amazing teams that build them. And, you know, looking at this, I just couldn't be more proud. So, so going back to what we believe the journey is, we, we think um, we are at the very beginning of a multi-year journey with, um, with streaming. You know, there is much more we don't know about streaming than we do know right now. And that's exactly why we came to market with our preview plan, where we, where you'll remember, and it seems like an age ago now, but we started last October with just four games in preview. And since then, we've expanded countries. We have more than 90 games. We've gone just from Android. We have test um, an iOS test flight running. And as we talked about before, we will also be bringing this to window Windows 10 PCs. This really is about a journey of us learning together with the developer community. And to see the passion with which developers have leaned into this with us and the learnings that we're doing together has just been mind blowing. It just makes me so proud to be a part of this team. That's awesome. And, and you mentioned just a moment ago the, the response from some of the game development community. Can you share a little bit about like, how has it been working with game developers? What have they been, what have they been saying in, in building for Project xCloud? Yeah, no, um, absolutely. You know what? I'm, I'm reminded actually back to a, uh, a story. We, we spent a lot of time obviously talking with developers before we launched into preview. And every time we would go to a meeting with a developer, we would take their game running on a mobile phone and hand it to them to play. And at that point, there was always silence in the room. And we kind of would look around the room and think, well, what's going on? And every and then it, the partner would start sort of looking around the room and you know talking to the, talking to their teams and saying, well, who worked on this? And it was very clear that no one had worked on it because actually, when you build for Xbox, you build for X Cloud. And what we had done is just made the game work automatically for them, really, and got it up and running pretty much in a matter of minutes. And that first stage, which we call lift and shift, literally taking a game that you've built for Xbox and putting it in the cloud, literally blew the developers away. Um, so, so that's been absolutely fascinating. And then we've just learned you know, so much about how gamers are using streaming. And basically, you know, we're seeing gamers play more across the board, which has been fascinating for developers. You know, they're not just playing more on xCloud, they're also playing more on Xbox and PC. And specifically, we're learning about different sort of genre types um, and what gamers who stream their games are enjoying perhaps more than others. So it really is a journey of us learning together. But we also are aware that there are some developers who, who want to be doing more to optimize their games for the cloud. And in those circumstances, we really talk about it as cloud aware. This is the work we're doing around touch controls to support native interaction, or some of the APIs that we're developing that provide device side characteristics so that developers can optimize for the much smaller screen size. So as you can see, it's literally this, this symbiotic journey that we're on with our developers um, to really, op, you know, begin to optimize this experience. Mm. You know, when I when I talk to my team, I, I really talk about 
you know, the speed of our learning cycles. Whenever you're bringing a new technology to market, it's all about learning. And the faster we learn, the better we're going to optimize this product. So, so that's absolutely the journey that we're on. Oh, that's so good. I always remember when I'm sitting in rooms with you, like the, one of the things you say is we always have to keep learning. We always have to keep improving. I feel like that's really an ethos that you've helped bring that along with the team, which is just so good. Chris, let's pivot over to you. As a service and platform provider, what do you think Microsoft's role is in helping game developers navigate new technologies like Xbox Series X and Project X Cloud? Frankly, if it's two words, it's eliminating friction, right? I mean, the, the game, game teams have a vision for what they want to build. And really, as a publisher, your job is to let them just execute on that and multiply the effort um, against it. And there are things that sometimes um, are tricky to manage when you're when you're a studio, right? Large or small. Um, sometimes business questions come up, and you you know you want to sell things in a different way, um, and the publisher does or doesn't support that. And so it's it's how do you push that and work with the publisher to get them to offer things in a different way? Sometimes it's technology. Um, hey, there's this new tech. We don't quite. Um, know what to do with it, or we have something and we want you to push it even farther. I mean, when I think about um, both xCloud and the Series X, right, more so than the GPU as a game designer, um, the game designs that you can build because you have a much more powerful CPU is actually super interesting because that's, you know, for a while now, we've been able to make graphics and worlds that look very real. Um, but the challenge frankly, from a, a game loop, from a game dynamics perspective, is how do you make those worlds act real, yeah. right? Physics and AI and doing all of the, that math actually requires uh, a CPU that's pretty strong. And so when you think about kind of the typical trade-offs that you've had in games in the past, or hey, I can have you know a small number of enemies that are really, really smart, or a large number of enemies that are eh, not so smart, you know, I mean, <laughs> grunts. Um, that's always been a trade-off that's limited what you can do in the games. And from the, you know, the, the fastest thing to make a developer laugh is, you know, as a designer, you go into a room and you tell them that you want to build a scene where you're fighting in water and, you know, you have, you have a bunch of these enemies and, and everything reacts dynamically to things getting wet, right? They just look at you and they're like, yeah, we can't do the physics for that. Like, you need a, you need a CPU with some power to do that. And so moving forward on something like uh, Series X and in the cloud... Um, and understanding, hey, this isn't just going to be something that where it's going to look much better. It's going to make that world feel and sound much more real. And mm. um, we're going to allow you to do much, much better things with physics, like simulations. Like those are the things that are going to allow games to take a giant step forward. And that's really what I'm excited to do. And as as a publisher, I mean, there's certainly the bread and butter work we do, um, you know, helping people understand uh, the research that we've done into different regions. If they want to know an, a customer that they're not familiar with um, in a different part of the globe, um, understand what their data pipeline and bandwidth is like in that region, um, understand where we think the technology is going understand the shell experiences that we're going to build that are basically the stage for their title, right? Like they're building this pearl and we're this, this oyster to showcase that pearl. Um, and really the publisher's job is how do you eliminate friction so that the game teams can just run at what mm. they're really good at and we can help support them with things that they shouldn't, they shouldn't have to care about, right? They shouldn't have to care about building tools to allow them to look at how to optimize their engine and what's going on in picks, right? They, that's, that shouldn't be their job. They shouldn't have to worry about building giant data centers across the planet, right? That should be our job. <laughs> we can go do that. They should focus on the game mm. and what's going to make it great. And so simply put, hey, how do we just make it easier for them and allow them to turn things up? That's good. And you, you mentioned as you're talking through this, this idea of this awareness. Um, and I think it's really interesting to talk about what it means to have your game be aware. And I hear you guys talk about this idea of the streaming aware point of view. Maybe Jason, can you, can you maybe elaborate a little bit on what does it mean to be streaming aware, building a game streaming aware? Yeah, so like like Catherine was talking about, you know, today with Project X Cloud, we're we're kind of doing what we call lift and shift, which is taking existing games that were already designed and built for Xbox and being able to run them in the cloud with the title not even really being aware that it's running in a remote data center. But I think there's a lot of power and I think there's a lot of opportunity if the title actually knows whether or not it's being streamed or not. And, it, and in this case, you know, we enabled uh, console streaming on the Xbox One uh, today. It's the same technology. Like if you're actually streaming from either your local console, you're streaming from Project X Cloud, 
what would you actually change in your game? So Catherine used the example of, if I know that my game is actually streaming down to a mobile device, maybe my I originally designed my HUD or my UI for a 10 foot user experience on a large screen TV. But when I'm actually streaming it to a mobile device, maybe I actually need to simplify the UI or increase the font size so it's more legible and easier to read. You also think about situations like multiplayer, like many multiplayer systems are designed with this notion of network latency and how do I keep people together? Well, if you knew that all your game sessions were actually all running in the same physical data center, you don't have to worry about ping times. You don't have to worry about uh, network latency. You know, and one of the technologies that we announced uh, earlier this week is dynamic latency input or DLI. Not only did we build that so that we will have the most precise uh, and responsive input possible, if you're playing a game in your living room, uh, say it's a competitive esports game, or it's a game that's running at 120 frames a second, where input latency really matters, but that same technology will also be available in Project X Cloud to allow a developer to actually measure their end-to-end -end input latency so they can actually optimize or customize the input experience when they're actually streaming to a mobile device uh, versus when you have a controller in your hands, as an example. So once again, when, when we really think about the continuum and how do we bring these things together, as we design and incubate and innovate in these various technology arenas, it's really about putting the power and the control in the developers' hands because they know what's best for their players and the game worlds that they're creating. And it's our job to provide the best platform possible so that they can deliver on that creative vision. Wow. So good. So good. I want to take that and I want to turn the question a little bit. And Rachel, let, let's go over to you for a bit. Um, this week, there's a lot of news coming out from gaming companies. And you know, thinking about how people are positioning hardware and cloud platforms, it's starting to feel like the story is becoming this either or narrative. In, in 2020, Microsoft's going to release both Project X Cloud and Xbox Series X. Now, Rachel, would you mind sharing a little bit about like, what is Microsoft's thinking behind this? Yeah, Brian, I'm, I'm happy to. Um, as we've mentioned, you know, gamers and developers are truly at the center of everything we do. Um, and for gamers, you know, our vision is for them to be able to play the games they want with the people they want, wherever they want. And we know that our partnerships with developers are key to delivering on this mutual goal that we have. Um, so we're taking our cues from gamers, from developers. Um, and as Catherine mentioned, you know, it is, it is valuable for us to get these learnings and to constantly be learning about that. We know that gamers want more games, they wanna play with more people, and they are playing on more devices around the world. And we know that developers are continually pushing boundaries trying to reach more gamers around the world who are playing on more devices and more platforms. And so the Xbox Series X was really built for this evolving landscape of gamers playing on multiple, multiple devices, but also this thing that we're seeing happening with technology converging across console, PC, and cloud. Mm. We want both gamers and developers to feel unconstrained in this next generation of gaming. Mm. And so we are working with developers to unlock the potential for what we can develop and deliver to gamers together. Hmm. And so more specifically from a developer perspective, Jason touched on some of this in his previous comments, you know, we're really aiming to build hardware that unleashes their creative vision. We're empowering them to create how they want because they know what's best for them. And we're providing the tools they need for now and for the future. Hmm. So this enables them to get their games to more gamers around the world, to more Xbox gamers around the world, whether they're playing on Series X, on PC, or xCloud. Um, I think it's, it kind of sums it up, you know, the question you ask about, you know, either or. You know, we believe that the best experience for gamers and developers is the experience that's designed from day one, so it's better together. Uh, so I think you could kind of say, our philosophy is an and philosophy, it's not an or philosophy. You know, we will lead with the flagship experience on our next-gen console, and we will extend that to players who want to play on xCloud. You said something that's super important, which is this idea of better together. And I think that is like a theme within just Microsoft and Microsoft GameStack. It's this idea that it's not an or statement, but it's an and statement, letting game developers really bring the tools that they're familiar with and be able to work with the stuff they love from Microsoft. So I really like that. I, I'm curious, Catherine, you know, this idea of better together, working on Project X Cloud and Xbox Series X, you know, from a cloud perspective, what are your thoughts on this, this better together story? 
Yeah, no, absolutely. I, I'm so pleased you called on me, Brian, because I was I was dying to add one thing to what Rachel said, which was so perfect. It's really about this idea of choice, mm. playing your games wherever you choose to play them. And we just had such a great story come in um, the other week from one of our preview testers. He's actually in the armed forces and he's currently deployed and he couldn't take his Xbox with him. But he gets to play Destiny 2 through the xCloud preview. And I just think that is so absolutely perfect and, you know, and really speaks to reaching people wherever they are. And then I also want to go sort of one point further with that, because, you know, we talked earlier about reaching the two billion gamers. That demands, you know, both both looking to the Xbox world as we know it, but also what we call TAM expansion, the total addressable market that we can expand to. And, you know, as you know, within preview, one of the markets we'll be coming to is India, where India is a huge gaming nation today. I think, in fact, I read somewhere that it's, you know, got the fifth most highly engaged gamer population. However, it's a market that we at Xbox don't know so well. So that is so fascinating as we work with developers to say, how can we bring these great games that we're building to new markets and new opportunities? Mm. And I really think that fits with the better together, that we take what we have and we bring it to new places and new people and new endpoints. So it just couldn't be a more exciting time to, to be part of Team Xbox. Yeah, and it's like there's this whole kind of world where it's all coming together. And, and Chris, I almost want to say, ask the same question to you is like, you know, when you think about it from the design perspective, building better together is not simple anymore just because you're having to deal with so many different endpoints and so many different customers and so many different games. Talk to a little bit about like what is the role of design in this idea of thinking about multiple products, multiple platforms, multiple networks? Well, to Catherine and Rachel's point around choice, when you look at it from the player's perspective, players love games what would they choose to do if you handed them a time travel device, right? Which is effectively what you do when you give somebody a cellular phone, right? Or something that they can take with them um, because they can't always sit in front of their PC or their laptop or their console to play the game that they so desperately want to play, right? People get, get tattoos of their favorite games, right? Like they, this is what they want to do bar all else. And when they find themselves, you know, physically standing in a line somewhere for five minutes, three minutes, two hours, however long it's going to be, their mind is often on that game. And what better than have their mind on that game but to actually give them that wormhole, give them that tunnel so that they can spend that five minutes or that 15 minutes, whatever it might be, interacting with the game they want to play. And sometimes, you know, through xCloud, it's, it's actually playing it. Sometimes it's through things like Mixer, what they're doing to watch it. Um, and it's really design's role to allow you, sometimes you want to play, sometimes you want to talk about that game with your friends. Um, if you have a device with you or around you throughout the day, what role do those devices serve? And, and design's job is to make sure that it's helping people connect to the content and to the people that they want to play that content with as often as they can, right? As often as they choose to, because that player choice, right? Physically, if I'm standing in that line and checked out, okay, cool. I want to play a game. I want to talk about that game. And if you give me a four minute window to do it, amazing i'm in and so on the you know certainly on the developer side you think about well hey what does it mean to build something that allows you to play for you know a shorter amount of time or to play continuously kind of throughout the day in small segments of time um, not just for you know an hour or six hours that you're going to spend sitting in front of your console or your pc and that's really what's amazing right when you talk about better together it's about how do you give people the choice to participate in the thing that they love more often and, and share that with more people. Um, and certainly that was the goal that we set out to accomplish. Um, and better together really just means being super attuned to letting gamers get closer to the thing that they love. You know, there's a, I wanna give a plug real quick for some content that we had that was pre-done uh, before the show taped. And it was this xCloud uh, talk that we have up on our on-demand site. So if you go to uh, aka.ms slash GameStackLab and you check out some of the xCloud content that's up on our YouTube page on demand, there's some fascinating stuff that's going on around the team and how they think about building for the platform. And Chris, I almost just want to ask a real quick follow-up on, which is like, re with regards to design itself, what are some of the challenges when trying to design a UI or a UX that can map across multiple devices? Oh, there's a lot. Um, it... <laughs> 
<laughs> for the user, I mean, there's there's literally like, hey, what's the type ramp and how do you make it work in multiple locations? You know, whether whether the the angular pixel density is different on a 10 foot screen than on something that's you know a foot or two in front of you, right? There's a bunch of just kind of technical details related to design, but really, when you think about what that UI is there to do. It's there to help connect you. And so the thing that might be appropriate in terms of, hey, I want to play right now, um, and this is how I want to interact with the game I love, is actually something different. And you might want to prevent, present more of a, a social view into that thing when you're looking at it on a cell phone in a short amount of time, because that's actually going to be the thing that then sets you up to play later in depth with your friends, right? It's how do you catalyze that group of people to get together. And when we talk to, we talk to gamers, you know, the number one thing that they say is, hey, I, I wish I could spend more time gaming. I just don't have enough time. And and it's even harder for me to find crossover time with, with my friends to play together, right? That's the problem that they would love help solving. And so from a UI perspective, there's literally how do you make this, you know, this UI look good on a different endpoint and what do I need to take into account from a design perspective? But it's also what should I be showcasing to the user? Because it might not be that they want to play right now. It might want to be that they are, are catalyzing a group to get together to play later tonight. And so having your UI have an understanding of what a player has been doing across your game um, is really, really important because then you can showcase that even within the game. Hey, we noticed you just finished. You know, How are you going to get on later tonight or this weekend? Um, those are two independent things, um, but they're very much both in design's wheelhouse to try and fix. And I think when you think about the ecosystem that you're attached to moving forward, design is going to be increasingly focused on how do I get players access to the right thing at the right time, at the right moment? Um, because certainly our job is to take care of things like the type ramp so that when you're looking at you know fonts on a, on a cell phone, um, when they've been streamed, that they're actually as appropriate there as they were on a 10-foot screen, right? That's just stuff we need to take care of. Awesome. Well, let's take that conversation a little bit, and let's, let's go a little bit more into our journey with developers. Now, Jason, this is a question for you. Given this is a year that we're shipping both a console and a streaming platform, you know, I'm curious, Jason, like, what is the approach Microsoft has taken in the journey of working with game developers? And then, Catherine, we're going to also ask you the same question, so hang tight. Yeah, it, it's actually kind of funny because uh, Catherine and I often do this together because we really don't talk to or engage with developers just on console or just on Project X Cloud or what we're doing with PC as an example. We really kind of talk to developers and lay out kind of our vision for the future and how we can help them deliver on the experiences that they want to provide to their players. Mm. So that, that means a consistent hardware platform between what's happening in the console ecosystem and what's happening in the uh, game streaming side. It's a common software platform, common APIs, the vast majority of the code that game developers actually write should be reusable across the cloud, across the console, across PC. So as we've updated our API designs and our uh, app model, we've really designed it so that it can work across multiple devices. And then really where we want developers to spend their time is focus on their game, making their game experience great so that players have a great experience, and then really kind of tailoring it to the unique capabilities of how they choose to deliver it. You know, simple things such as if I'm playing on a console, clearly I'm going to, you know, prioritize or lead with controller-based input. But if the same game is being played on a PC, keyboard and mouse is critically important. Or maybe in a Project X Cloud scenario, it's more about touch controls or making it easier for, for a player to, to play the there. So, you know, it's actually been one of the highlights for me over the last uh, three to four years is as we've been developing these plans, as we've been challenging the teams internally on kind of this next generation and how we think about uh, gaming and game development is going out and actually talking to the partners and, you know, hearing their feedback, you know, telling them, here's where we see things are going, getting the feedback directly from them, and then adjusting and altering our plans. Because at the end of the day, you know, we all just want those same great gaming experiences. And as Rachel and Chris and Catherine have said, you know, it's really about making sure that the players all across the world can have these same great gaming experiences and doing it in such a way that we make it as easy as possible for developers. 
Oh, that's awesome. And I almost want to touch on that again, too. You said something that was really interesting about working with developers. And it's this idea of like, we have all of these developers who are coming and watching GameStack Live right now and are participating in their Discord channel, following us on Twitter. For folks that are not currently working with Microsoft today and they're wanting to think about, you know, the next generation of hardware, the next generation of, of streaming, like, what are some advice, some tips that you give in, in like, hey, this is what we've experienced working with game developers today. Here's some ideas of how to think about that. Maybe, Jason, you could start there and then Catherine, we're going to come over to you. Sure. I think the core of it is, is honestly, just keep building games the way that you always have been building games. You know, if you're building a game on PC today, we've made it very easy to take a PC code base and get it running on console or getting it running in the cloud. We partner very closely with all the industry's leading middleware providers and engine providers to make sure that they're optimized to take full advantage of what we deliver, whether it's hardware capabilities or some of the services that we have with Xbox Live and Azure Play Fab. Um, you know, and it, it's really about the, the part that's really exciting about this industry and part of the reason why I love this industry is it's the marrying of creativity and technology. Yeah. Um, and that's the thing that the, the game developers all across the world, whether it's, you know, the largest studios working on a AAA blockbuster or small, you know, super creative independent creators, it's about the creativity and it's about the worlds that you want to create and the experiences that you want to deliver to players. Yeah. And it's our job uh, at Team Xbox to really remove the technology and make the technology fade away in the background. And developers are just really focused on creating that immersive experience that players want to spend time in. Mm, that's good. Catherine, how would you say the same thing? You know, like, what are your experiences and, and what are your thoughts on how a, a game developer should think about building for this next generation of hardware, building for this next generation of streaming? Yeah, you know, I, I'm just going to start. Jason said it so beautifully. We often go out together and exactly what just happened happens. Jason just says it so beautifully that I just kind of need to go. It's what he said. But um, <laughs> but I'll try and add to that in that, um, you know, as we as we talked about before, this first step of the journey that we think that we think we're on is what we're calling lift and shift. It's the convenience of developing for the Xbox that then magically works in the cloud. And that's a really important first step. And then Jason took us through it earlier. And I also talked to some of the touch controls and APIs we're talking, we're building around sort of providing more information about whether the game is streaming. And that is the, the next piece, which is the cloud aware piece, which just allows us to optimize games. An important point that we probably haven't touched on so far, but is absolutely something that thinking about is this concept of what we're calling cloud native games. These are games that no longer just use the resources of the, of the local device, but harness the full power of the cloud. And it's so fascinating. Um, before you know, the world got stopped by the coronavirus, I had an incredible trip to Japan and Korea meeting with a ton of developers. You know, and, and so fascinating to see how people were leaning in to really understanding how the cloud could actually change the process of development, the iteration of development, where teams sat to develop, as well as then, and I think it was Chris who mentioned it earlier, this idea of frictionless play, and therefore what that meant for the numbers of people who could play together, or even some of the business models and monetization of games. And what we're really seeing here is just creativity unleashed. Mm. You know, as Jason just said, it's our job to put the technology somewhere behind so that others can just leverage it. And our vision is for developers to be able to really leverage the true power of the, of the cloud. And we're not just seeing this excitement with some of our larger developers. I am just, it's incredible the support we've had from Chris Charles' ID at Xbox program and the indie developers. And our message to those developers is really clear. We just want you to focus on your games and your gameplay. You know, don't worry about porting it to other platforms. We're gonna take care of that. Between the console and the cloud, we're gonna take care of that for you. And so that's what I think is so exciting about this period. And that's that's the energy we get as, uh, as we meet with uh, developers is that this period is about literally this unleashing of creativity, and that can only be great for gamers. 
So something that not a lot of people outside of Microsoft get a chance to hear, which is just like some of the high level thinking, some of the philosophies behind why we're doing this. You know, Catherine, could you maybe touch on just for a second of like, where do we see this all going? We, we always talk about how we want to put the gamer at the center. We want to make sure that they can play the games they want on the devices they want with the people they want. Like, how does this all kind of play into the larger mission at Microsoft? Yeah, no. Well, I don't know that I can speak to the larger mission of Microsoft, but I can certainly speak to how we view the vision as a team, which is it's all about ubiquity. Your game should be available to play on any device at any point that, uh, that you choose to play. And the community and all your saves and everything else related to the game just comes with you. I mean, think about it. We've seen this in, in video. You know, you can watch your Netflix, you know. I mean, I, I personally choose, and everybody scoffs at me, but I personally choose to watch most of my movies on my phone. But obviously, you can watch it on any device that you choose. And I really think this concept of ubiquity is absolutely key. It's about reaching every platform. And it's about us, you know, for developers, as I said before, really leveraging the cloud and through our partners with Azure, which is, you know, as we know, one of the world's leading cloud with, uh, you know, with huge geographical footprint to really allow us to reach gamers who previously it was much harder for us to reach with this fidelity of game. So that's really our high level vision. That's good. And, you know, I think in talking with a lot of these developers, especially as they're starting to kind of get to that next stage, one of the questions that, you know, I think a lot of people who are not necessarily engaged with Microsoft today around Xbox Series X or Project X Cloud is for, for developers who are sitting on the fence, maybe uh, Rachel, if you could answer like, what would you say to a developer who's kind of like looking at this technology and saying like, I don't know, when, when's the right time to get involved? I think it's a lot of what Catherine and Jason touched on. Jump in, right? Um, you know, I think back to when we started our indie game studio, seems like a lifetime ago. Um, you know, there were three of us. We didn't know what we didn't know. And that actually enabled us to go do really awesome things. And for, for us at Team Xbox, you know, we truly love hearing those ideas and seeing what developers can create because we're not going to tell you what to do and we shouldn't tell you what to do. Um, you're going to tell us, right? And so if I, you know, put myself in, you know, my own shoes uh, a long time ago, um, I won't age myself. Um, you know, I think it would just be jump in, right? Jump in, work with us, reach out to us, help us learn what we don't know, help us figure out that to reduce that friction, to help you be able to deliver those creative visions, you know, especially as we think about, you know, developing for both console and cloud, um, the cloud space is so exciting. Um, I don't think we even know what that's going to look like. You know, I, I always talk to the team about, you know, watching my children play. Um, they play together. They're on multiple devices. They're constantly going back and forth between devices. Um, and it's where their friends are is where they go. I think when, when we think about the opportunity across all these platforms and all these devices, that's what Xbox wants to bring to developers, the ability to reach gamers where we see them going. Mm. And so jump in. That's good. So let's talk real quick about some of the, the key learnings that we've gotten from development partners during the, you know, the work that we've done to build out Xbox Series X and Project X Cloud. I always love the fact of like, it's great to hear what's going well. What are some challenges that people just have in general building for the cloud and, and building for new, new technology? Um, Jason, let's go to you. Uh, sure. So, so, you know, I think one of the things that's exciting about, uh, the transition of a, a generation is what you used to think of previously as constraints. Many times they go away. You know, I mentioned like the IO system and the fact that we're at the upper bounds of what's possible with a rotational drive. Now that that's no longer a barrier, it opens up all these new possibilities, but then all of a sudden we're going to discover kind of some of the next challenges. Mm. You know, it's like now I have almost, you know, kind of unlimited memory and I can feed it into the system. But now all of a sudden, you know, certain limitations we previously counted on no longer exist. And I think that challenges a lot of preconceived notions. Um, so I think there's that. And I think the other thing, too, is just 
you know, with, you know, uh, there's times where uh, there's a member of the team who she mentioned, you know, with Xbox One X, it was like getting a playground to play with. And then with something like Xbox Series X, now the team has an entire amusement park to play with. So it can be a little bit overwhelming to actually figure out, like, where do I want to invest? You know, what are these new opportunities that I have? So I think the real guidance that I'd give to developers in the community out there is, you know, challenge yourselves, think creatively. What is the what is the gaming experience you always wanted to build? And, you know, a little bit to what we've talked about throughout today, you know, if there's ever something where, you know, the software is not enabling you to do it or the developer, development tools would be more useful if they did this or my iteration time needs to improve, we want that feedback. We need that feedback. We absolutely listen to that feedback and it fundamentally shifts the direction that we go. So we listen very closely to the gaming community. We're all gamers ourselves. We all play on Xbox Live almost every day. We have family members that we play with and we connect with. But it's also true with developers as well. You know, we want to know where we've gotten it right. We want to know where you're struggling. And it's our challenge then is to take that feedback and go away and come up with really creative solutions that meets the needs of the development community so that you guys can just focus on delivering that amazing gaming experience that all of us can't wait to actually play. Ah, oh, that's so good. That's so good. All right, I think we're getting tight on time, so we're going to do what's called the lightning round. We have a set of questions we're going to ask every single person here. What are the most important things for a game developer to take away from this conversation today? Rachel, let's start with you. Okay, I'll try to be super quick since you said we're tight on time. Um, I think my hope is that the biggest, one of the biggest takeaways from today is a feeling of excitement. Yeah. You know, as, as we've mentioned, you know, we're in the midst of something, you know, very crazy, unprecedented going on in the world. There's a lot of heaviness. Um, I hope that anybody listening, whether it was a developer, a gamer, maybe a student who's supposed to be doing remote learning, um, that they feel that light inside of them, that they feel that passion that we all have for gaming. Um, I hope they're excited, excited about the future, excited about our next gen hardware and software, excited about you know, how we can do things together and the things we're going to build together to reach gamers around the world so that they can play, watch, communicate, and create together. That's good. That's good. Chris, let's go over to you. What is the most important thing a game developer should take away from this conversation? You know, I was really hoping to talk about what we've learned uh, in relation to input and uh, skill ceiling, right? Like if you, if you tell everybody, hey, we're going to pack a stadium of people to go watch Tic-Tac-Toe, that wouldn't be the case because the world championship of tic-tac-toe is going to be boring because there's no skill ceiling, right? It, it always comes out as a tie. And as we've gone down this route and looked at what the new generation of people growing up learning how to use, um, you know, play games on glass natively, which is, is different than certainly how I grew up, you know, playing games on mouse and keyboard and with the controller, people can play games on glass to a degree and a fidelity which allows a skill ceiling, which is actually pretty incredible. And it was, you know, two years ago when we kicked off our journey looking at that, um, I didn't think that was gonna be the case. And now that we've looked at it both on the customer side and what the best kind of game developers on the planet are doing, people are really solving the skill problem or the skill ceiling problem. So when you think about pushing a, a game out, I would not be worried about thinking about a phone perhaps as the lowest common denominator be confident that you can actually make the game that you've built originally you know when you were thinking about a pc or a console you can make that skill ceiling you can make that thing excellent um, no matter where it's being streamed to mm, that's good all right catherine let's go to you what is the most important thing that a developer can take away from this conversation today yeah yeah absolutely what i would say is look embrace the the new be open to learning and don't constrain your thinking by frameworks that have existed in gaming previously i think we're in a period where we are rewriting the rules of traditional game development. And I think that's such an exciting period with huge opportunity. And the only way that we can really, you know, um, leverage that is by being open to any amount of possibilities and just increasing those learning cycles. So be open to the new, that's my main takeaway. That's good. And Jason, what is the most important thing a developer can take away from today's conversation? 
It's kind of funny. I'm like Catherine. Everybody else said it so eloquently. I don't know how much more I can add. I guess the only thing that I would add to what everybody else has really talked about is just focus on the player, focus on the gamer, just really focus on how can you delight that player? You know, the the need to play is just a fundamental human condition. And that's why I think many of us work in this industry and we love this industry uh, because at the end of the day, our job is great fun and there's nothing better to do. Uh, and so as long as you're focusing on the player, we're here to help in any way that we can. We want the feedback from the community, both players and developers. Uh, but as long as you're focusing on the player, I don't think you can really go wrong. That's good, man, so good. Well, thank you guys so very much for joining over the phone. It has been an awesome chance to talk with this. That's it for us. Malik Kelly, over to you. Oh, he, he, took, he, took, the, he took the console. Oh. Anyway, thanks, Brian. Well, Kelly, if you wanted to know more about next-gen hardware and what it can do uh, in the cloud, uh, we can all cross that off the list yep. right now. Indeed, indeed. I could not be more excited, and that was such a great conversation. What do you guys think, and Malik, what do you think? What do I think? Yeah. I think this is an exciting period in time. Uh, Next-gen hardware, Xbox Series X, coming out this year, holiday 2020. You can't just say it as an Xbox Series X. That's true, that's true. Anyway, <laughs> oh, sorry, you're right. Yeah. <clears throat> Xbox Series X. Thank you. Uh, so everyone out there, head over to our Discord and let us know uh, what you think about it and, and tell us about all the things Xbox Series X and xCloud, which I'm super excited about um, in any event. Um, in fact, we've got some teams from our some of our favorite games in chat as well. Apparently. That's right, like Age of Empires. I'm so excited. That's actually my favorite game of all time, Age of Empires 2 specifically. Really? Yeah, okay, it's a great game. It, it actually caused me to kind of get into gaming and, and to do what I do right now. Gotta love strategy games. Wololo, right? Isn't that the, the thing? Wululu. Wululu, sorry. Yes, I, thank I you. You were close. You, I I, you knew, you knew it. You knew. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Now, Malik, we've seen a ton already over the last two days. Panels with industry leaders, conversations with studio directors, and even some ID at Xbox Pros. What has been your highlight and why has it been the panel that we just saw, actually? Oh, you know what? I, I was going to say, I think I kind of gave it away that yeah. that was the most exciting. I think, again, uh, I am, we said it at the beginning of yesterday, uh, a lifelong Xbox fan. And one of the things that I've always dreamed about is being at Microsoft during the launch of a new console. And Xbox Series X coming out this year is going to be fantastic. Um, as we heard on the last panel, the focus on performance, speed, and of course, compatibility. The idea that you're going to have thousands of games from previous Xbox uh, generations playable on your console. So the SSD, which is brand new for a new generation of consoles, it's first ever generation that's going to have an SSD built in to the console, and of course, just 12 teraflops of, of GPU power. So it's just, 12 it's fun. teraflops. It's just fun saying that, right? Exactly. 12 teraflops, of course. Exactly. So yeah, uh, Kelly, what was your highlight, though? Ooh, ooh. Uh, I really like the accessibility conversations that we got to have yesterday, and, and like just learning about live ops and live services. It's incredible. Just learning kind of what game stack is and if there's any developers out there that are just kind of joining right now and don't know what it is check out gamestack.com also our youtube is going to have vods available of all of the uh talks and panels that we've had over the last two days so if you did miss it if you're just joining us right now do not fret everyone because all that will be available soon i believe they keep saying soon with soon. like maybe a tm a soon. tm yeah soon yeah. tm because you know who's who's ever to say when when something's gonna happen and then one thing that i've loved over these last two days is talking to you and you said a lot so let's check out what you said in uh out here uh, our last panel on next gen gaming features xbox's partner director of program management jason ronald and due to technical issues brought on by our remote interviews we had to use head headshots and someone has taken jason's and doctored a bit uh a huge thanks to enrivo for this let's take a look <laughs> at this okay so jason let me just say something uh, <laughs> ooh, wait um, so Jason has one of the most glorious beards I've ever seen in it my really life. It really is. The Even length. just like the pat, like the length, the pattern of it, how like half of it's gray, half of it's dark. We also have that strip of gray down the dark. Like it's really cool. It's very, uh, very deliberate and very, um, Regal? I don't know what the word would be. I don't know. But I, like, I like Regal. It's really cool to see he's just perching over Xbox because he is literally the guy who's put everything together. And so uh, along with obviously a great team. And so this is really cool to see. Uh, and I think we have a few more tweets, in fact. So let's see what we've got here. I do think that was to scale, though, the, the picture of him. Yeah. It's gonna, you know, it kind of actually, it, it doubles as a heater for your house. It doubles as a lot, right? Yeah. I, I think it's funny because Xbox actually tweeted out a picture on Monday of 
you know, to scale an Xbox X, Series X console next to a fridge. So it's really, it's really funny. All right, so we have another tweet from one of our Xbox MVPs, in fact. This is Simon Darkside. It says, my favorite quote from the team, let's look back at here, because this is easier to see. My favorite quote from the team at GameStack Live today is this, something else you should know. The same team that solved the amazing technical feat of Xbox 360 back and pat is also the team that feat created, excuse me, Project X Cloud. Awesomeness to the max. Ooh. 100%. So just to give a note on that, back in uh, E3 2015, we announced Xbox uh, 360 backward compatibility on Xbox One, something that wasn't possible, but thanks to the amazing uh, engineers and teams here at Xbox, we were able to make it happen. And so they are working on Project X Cloud. It's going to be fantastic, lots of solutions, but I'm super excited to see it all It really that. is exciting, just to like how how gaming and game development like like uh, evolves every, every iteration, every generation. There's something new that they yeah. add, something incredible with the teams that we have here. I'm I'm really excited, although, you know, we were talking about our favorite parts of today. I think actually my favorite oh. part might be this next conversation that you're going to be having with Double Fine. You are a huge fan. I am. I'm I mean, very excited. Between Grim Fandango, you have Psychonauts 2 that's coming out this year. <laughs> And then, uh, of course, I think Brutal Legend does not get as much love as it deserves here. But let's go back on to our tweets here. Right. Xbox Series X plus Project X Cloud equals new chapter in game. Hey, new chapter, the evolution. That's Brand pretty much what I was saying. Thank you. NES bot feed. What? Oh, is that a bot? Love that. Oh, okay. And did Ricari pay to get his tweet up here? I think Unbelievable so. Unbelievable. I heard him talking a little bit back in the production, but he's like, you guys better put this up there. You got to show my... Although it is really cool, the shoes with the shirt. And I do believe that we yesterday heard that some people were asking, how do we get these shirts? How do I, how do I get this jacket? Well, I don't know. That's, that's the answer. I was no. going to say, I was like, no. does Kelly have an answer but that I don't know about? You know, if you complain enough, maybe something will happen. Maybe something will happen. All I got to say is, Ricari, I, I heard it in my ear uh, that Ricari definitely did pay okay. uh, for this free promotion, uh, in which case I would like to know how much that costs because I would like to do that as well. Anyway. <laughs> well, everyone, now it's time to check out one of the most creative ecosystems in the gaming industry that has helped propel a dev team to gaming glory. Here now, what drives Double Fine? If we were making a list of priorities for the company, the word at the top of the list would be creativity. That's something we like to see in every game that we make and everything that we do, whether it's our business or, our, you know, our, um, I don't want to say creative finances. That probably sounds bad. A game shouldn't just be one person's vision. There's always going to be something in like a Double Fine project that will appeal to like a very wide variety of people because we have such a, a wide variety of people making that content here. That's just what makes our game special. Double Fine games, they feel like they're made by humans. That's something that I think leads to a unique feeling in our, in our games. Thinking outside of the box, access to a counterculture you may not necessarily see in games. People come to Double Fine to play games that are different and unique. I started the company because I had an idea for a game, Psychonauts. It struck me at a certain point that, that the game had been doing my ideas for 10 years, and there were so many creative people at the company. How do we get everybody's ideas to the forefront? So we uh, took a break during Brutal Legend, and we split the whole company, 60 people, into uh, four smaller teams, which seemed crazy at the time. Like, first of all, we're going to stop working on this game, which is, it's not like it's ahead of schedule. Um, we're going to make a game in two weeks? That sounds crazy. But out of it came these amazing little game demos. And we liked it so much, we did it again in a, in a year or so, and it was amazing. Amnesia Fortnite, we kind of come together and pitch new ideas for these two-week prototypes. Another part of fostering creativity is trying new disciplines. There's a lot of people who have done 3D modeling who want to try concept art, but it doesn't really fit our game production schedule to like switch people out of their discipline all the time. But during Amnesia Fortnite, we always say everybody can try anything else they want to try. It just gives someone a chance to figure out, wow, that is what I really like to do, or else, whoo, I am so glad I don't do that for a living because that was hard. <laughs> uh, it's 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 scary but fun at the same time because you're learning a new skill. It helps you understand other people at the studio at a deeper level because you're sort of being in their shoes, you know? It can be a lot of pressure, but I think overall, I don't think anyone would get rid of it here if you asked them. Did you ask them? Ask them if they want to get rid of it. That's your question. Should we stop it? Because I think, I think they'd say no. 
Amnesia Fortnite opens up a sphere of voices that we wouldn't normally hear from. If you're in the studio, you can pitch. We've even had people from outside of the studio coming in pitch games before. <laughs> Everyone gets to participate and everybody's ideas are important, but the really strong ones bubble up to the top and you get to realize them. Kaiju Piledriver is a Godzilla-inspired roguelike action game where you control a giant rubber-suited monster destroying corporate cities. A special helmet allows you to launch his head from his body, fly it around, land into, and take control of the robot bodies of enemy forces. A dim sum dining experience simulator called uh, Dumb Sim. <laughs> An immersion narrative game where you play a despotic ruler guiding the future of a post-revolution republic. Gone Astray is a 3D action-adventure game where you play a house cat exploring the outside world. I was uh, part of a documentary team called Two Player Productions, and in 2012 we partnered with Double Fine on a Kickstarter project to fund not just a video game that they were going to make, but a documentary that we were making about how they make that game. Tim like came to us and was just like, you know, you guys can pitch ideas too if you want to, because they were taking ideas from anybody who worked here. Come here. This way, Austin. Yeah, this side. This side, see that? Look at that, right there? Look at that. See that? I was like, I'm gonna do it this year. I have no experience developing games at all, and it was already nerve-wracking enough to pitch to these people who we had been observing for so long. I pitched just thinking that I wasn't going to get picked. Uh, it goes to a vote. The studio as a whole will pick one, and then Tim will usually pick one. The public has voted on him before. The pitch that I went with was called The Gods Must Be Hungry, and that is a cooking game, but it's also an action platformer, so. The whole time you're doing this, there is a god moving through the town, and you're trying to get get all of your stuff together and get to the arena before he does. I'll be honest, I don't really know uh, exactly what I need just because <laughs> I have not done this uh, before, ever. That's the one that ended up getting picked uh, that year. And the final one, oh, this can't be right. This breaks a lot of rules. The gods must be hungry, Asa Siddiqui. <laughs> Holy cow! So the first thing that hits you, I think, is just immediate terror. It's like 90% joy, 10% terror. <laughs> Holy crap, that sounds really intense and awesome, but extremely terrifying. <laughs> everything's great, everything's great. Oh my God, oh my God, oh my God, this is terrible. I'm the worst creative person ever. The, the people who run the projects go from, uh, you know, terror to absolute panic. Which is worse, terror or panic? Anyway, they go back and forth in between those. Then it's, it's, it's madness for two weeks. We're given the list shortly before uh, those teams are announced, and then we stand there and everyone else is on one side of the room and all the leads are over on the other side, and we just call people out one at a time, and the team sort of like clump together and then immediately break and start talking about uh, what they're gonna do that day. We, as a team, uh, figure out how much we can get done. <laughs> Every decision matters, and it's not so much that days matter, it's that hours matter, and the decisions you make within those hours all add up. So that's why it's intense. Uh, I guess the biggest takeaway for me, I had this intense pressure that I was putting on myself to like have immediate answers to every single question. What I learned over the process was that once any project starts, like it is not your idea anymore, it belongs to the group, and you just have to trust that you will arrive at solutions together, and it's not on you to like be the sole decision maker for every single step of the way. Bing! You sold it. Pencils down, deadline, everyone stops working, lock, we lock the servers, can't put anything else on there. And then we'll have a gameplay festival. <laughs> yes! Yes! Oh, yes! Yeah! And we'll all run back to our desks and we'll all play it and we'll come back and then we'll talk about it. And then the next game is announced and then we all run back to our desks and we'll have a, a like a day-long festival where we play the games for an hour or so and talk about them all. And that's a really exciting event. Awesome. Well, here, look, you did it. You made uh, a game, yeah. right? Uh, we made a game. Oh, we'll with... see. An amazing we'll see, team. Maybe. It's a game. All right. It's a beautiful right. game. I like his asymmetric uh, glove. What the heck? <laughs> All right. Holy cow. Exciting. Okay. Everyone really just stepped up and it was it was great. People also went so above and beyond what I thought we were gonna have time for that it actually turned out to be way better than I, I could have possibly imagined. Huh?
Maybe the last or second to last day, the guys asked me, what do you think is going to happen afterwards? I was saying that, you know, I'm a little depressed, honestly. Like, all these guys are gonna go back to making video games and I never will. And I so regret saying that now because you should really never say never. The Psychonauts team came to me and they were saying, hey, would you like to work on this for a couple of months? And I, like, of course said yes. I think the idea was initially that I would be on it four to six months and now it's two and a half years later and I'm still working. What I know now compared to what I knew back then is, is staggering to me. Being uncomfortable is good. If you keep doing the same safe things, you're just not going to realize your full potential or have new stories to tell. Sometimes you need a push or a big kick in the ass. That's what, that's what it is. <laughs> Tim has created a culture here at Double Fine where it's okay to feel uncomfortable when you're pushing into something new. You know, I never really felt like if I messed this up, I was going to be like looked down upon or kicked out of the company. That's what's unique about Double Fine. Um, I've been at large studios where you're like a cog in a wheel because the machine is so big. Um, but here, people are not uh, pigeonholed into doing one thing. And that's where I think we just generate so many great ideas. Good ideas can come from anywhere. And we should always try and uh, not just encourage that, but nurture it as well. Uh, so it's like one thing to say, sure, the video crew can pitch ideas, get up there and, and tell us what you're thinking. But to then follow through on that and uh, collectively come together and support that person and teach them what they need to know is what makes the culture here so unique. Just to keep people excited about their own ideas. We've all sort of grown up together here and uh, it makes me feel like I'm year to year like making the right choice in staying here. It's learning, it's all about learning. I mean, well, I want the company to be a celebration of creativity. Some people think, you know, creativity is like a magic thing that only creative people can do, but I believe every single person in the world is creative. Ah, what a piece indeed. Uh, let's talk about it. Join me now in welcoming Asif from Double Fine. Asif, are you there? I am. How's it going? Uh, it's going well. It's going well. Thank you so much for joining me. Um, that was a fantastic piece. Uh, we're going to get to it in just a second. Um, but you mentioned you're not here. You don't have much in, in game development. Can you tell us what you do at Double Fine to start off? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm working as a level designer right now on the project. Uh, but before that, uh, I was part of the documentary crew that's been making a series about Double Fine for the last eight years. So it's been a bit of a shift. Eight years for documentary. That's fascinating. And and again, we're going to talk about this journey because going from someone who's making, sort of documenting Double Fine's journey to being a level designer, that is a fascinating jump. So let's get your gut reaction on that piece that you just saw. What, what were your thoughts? Uh, I mean, it's, it's really wild to see. Uh, it just feels like this crazy time capsule in a way. And uh, not just of my own time there, but um, just in the... Um, the history of, of folks that have come through and uh, gone since then and the projects that they worked on. And uh, it's just been really wild that, um, you know, no matter who makes up the studio, the spirit of the creativity has always stayed the same. And I think that's just a real testament to the uh, culture that Tim has created there. Yeah, and I was going to say the main word there is culture. We saw it throughout the entire piece. Um, not mm -hmm. only, I mean, I guess we've seen it over these past few days from various uh, developers, but I think really fostering a creative uh, culture, a one where everyone feels like they have the opportunity to, to you know, um, contribute an idea. Um, can you give us a little bit more context into what Amnesia Fortnite is? Yeah, absolutely. So it's a, a two-week game jam, basically. And uh, we all stop whatever projects we're currently working on at the studio. And then uh, the floor is sort of opened to anyone uh, at Double Fine to pitch an idea. And uh, it's varied from year to year as to how the projects get selected. Sometimes it's open to the public. Sometimes the studio votes internally. Other times uh, Tim will pick uh, an idea. But we basically arrive at four or five ideas out of all of those pitches. And then we develop prototypes uh, for those over those two weeks. And it's, it's such a fascinating idea that you would stop sort of development. And we'll get, that, get to that in a second. But I want to ask you a very direct mm. question about your sure. game that you developed because the gods must be hungry. I think Double Fine is sort of known for a very certain type of game. One, it's a little bit wacky, a little bit uh, complex in a way. Um, what inspired you to create uh, The Gods Must Be Hungry? Where did that come from? Oh, man. <laughs> uh, I haven't thought about that project in a while. But uh, really, like, my main hobby is cooking. Um, so I spend a lot of time just walking, watching cooking shows, um, cooking videos, uh, everything from like the instructional stuff to the competitive shows. Um, and I love Food Wars, the, uh, the anime. So like, I think all of those things have just sort of come together 
uh, and obviously some cooking games as well, like Overcooked, uh, you know, the influence of that can't be uh, overstated. So. Yeah, I mean, I, I will say Overcooked is, is one of those games you shouldn't play with friends, but definitely a great game. <laughs> You'll probably lose a few of the friends. Um, but let's exactly. go back to that creative environment because I think, you know, we again, we have a lot of developers that are watching and they, they want to figure out, like, how do they get in that creative space? What advice would you give other developers um, looking to jumpstart creativity specifically on their team? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think the biggest thing, like, especially for me, like coming from uh, such a different background uh, with filmmaking, I think the best advice I can give someone is to do things other than just play games uh, or don't just play video games, uh, play board games, you know, watch movies, read books, listen to music, uh, you know, take up a physical hobby that uh, you have to use your hands uh, to get involved in. You know, ideas come from like all sorts of crazy places and, you know, you might be just like cleaning up around the house or vacuuming one day and then suddenly you're you know, uh, coming up with Katamari Damacy, you know. Uh, and I think experiencing those things with your team and talking about those experiences will, like, basically expose ideas that you wouldn't have arrived at yourself. So I think it's really valuable to do all of those things I mentioned, but then also to talk about them with other people. Yeah, uh, shout out to Katamari, by the way. We should Hopefully we get another one in the very near future. Anyway, Double Fine, I, uh, wish. I know, right? Uh, now, the Double Fine culture is all about um, the best idea, no matter where it comes from. And I think your example is a perfect example of that. Um, just, I guess, maybe um, studio-wide, what are some best practices? We saw Tim Schafer in there. Um, he was with you all. Like, he was the one who was announcing the winner. He was there helping you along the process. What mm -hmm. advice would you give to studios that are looking to foster that space specifically? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is that um, at Double Fine, the door just always feels open and you have to leave multiple doors open for people. And what I mean by that is that, you know, everyone has a different way of expanding up in meetings. Some people are comfortable just walking right up to you in the hall. Uh, other people uh, will like want to email you privately afterwards. And uh, I mean, that was the approach that I took personally. Um, you know, we were shooting all those meetings all those times uh, for uh, Broken Age and uh, maybe email the the head of the studio or something like that. But I think mm -hmm. to your point, you know, the fact that you felt comfortable enough to email Tim is a great example of how you foster a great, uh, you know, creative environment. But uh, hold tight, Asif, because we're going to provide a bit more context on these creativity sprints with this piece of bonus footage. Check it out. Sure. If we were making a list of priorities for the company, I think the word at the top of the list would be creativity. That's something we like to see in every game that we make, in everything that we do, whether it's our business or our, um, I don't want to say creative finances. That probably sounds bad, but you know, we try and uh, uh, put creativity in everything that we do. How do we get everybody's ideas uh, to the forefront? Like when you're in the middle of a game production, it can be a really heavy thing, just like you've been thinking about these characters in this world for so long. Just taking some time off to do something else can be really in, uh, creatively invigorating. So we uh, took a break during Brutal Legend and we split the whole company, 60 people, into uh, four smaller teams. And each team had two weeks to make a game. First of all, we're going to stop working on this game, which is, it's not like it's ahead of schedule. Um, we're going to make a game in two weeks? That sounds crazy. But we had really, really interesting ideas that we still got learned a lot from. And we liked it so much we did it again in a, in a year or so. And out of that, we got the ideas for Costume Quest, Stacking, Happy Song, which would eventually become Once Upon a Monster, Custodians of the Clock, uh, which would become Iron Brigade. And it was amazing because it was chaotic. It was crazy. Some people wonder why we were doing it. But out of it came these amazing little game demos that um, made everyone excited because they were about completely different things than what we were working on as a studio. And then um, we shipped Brutal Legend, and then we were working at Brutal Legend 2, and then it got canceled kind of unceremoniously, and we had nothing else going on, and we had 60 people to pay. And we thought, I guess we're going to go out of business, but we have like um, eight amazing demos sitting on the servers that we should look at. and. Um, because we'd always secretly like, we should make these into real games. This, you know, costume quest and stacking. And so we took uh, those four, um, those four prototypes, and we took them on the road and we pitched them to publishers and we got all four of them signed. And so we ended up, Amnesia Fortnite saved the company when we needed it the most. Um, these game ideas, these little tests ended up um, saving us. So it was really amazing. And I think it really spoke to what we're all about as a company is that it was this burst of creativity that ended up really saving us financially in every other way. 
Ah, oh, love the extra context there from Tim. Uh, Asif, I feel like it feels a bit counterintuitive to stop production on one game, probably the game that your studio is betting on the most, to go through this creative process of Amnesia Fortnite. What would you say to devs and teams who are a bit skeptical about that approach? Hmm. Um, I would say don't shy away from it. Um, you know, I, I sort of like the analogy I would liken it to is, is like if you're working out, you don't just necessarily hit every single muscle group every single day, all the time. Uh, you have to sort of like mix it up a little bit. And I think it's the same with creativity. Uh, it helps to go be in another space for a little bit if you have the luxury to do that. Um, I mean, I feel like every single time we've observed people doing this, because I've been around for a few AFs now, not participating, but just watching and documenting. Um, you know, you always see people like at the end of it, even though it's an insane process, like they're always super excited to get back to the project that they were working on because like they're now seeing it in a different light or they've just like had the breathing room to like think about a different problem. And, uh, you know, suddenly it's just like, oh, how can I maybe like fit this idea into the project we've been working on? Or, um, you know, like, oh, I suddenly realized how I can do this thing. Um, Let's, let's go, you know? So I think it totally makes sense to do it every now and then. It might actually be considered part of the process to take a break. Yeah, I mean, I love that. For any devs watching out there, I think Amnesia Fortnite is a great example, and Tim kind of alluded to it, of this idea that your game could get canceled at any second. He, Tim talked about Brutal Legends 2, um, but mm. Amnesia Fortnite allowed you the flexibility to say, hey, we have a bunch of these demos that we could utilize, and you're able to work off of that. I think that's fantastic. And another point that you just mentioned, which I think was super important was that it allows you to go back to the main game with some new perspective which is something that we were actually talking about backstage before this whole interview is like you can now go within a with a fresh set of eyes and it's it's really cool to see um hopefully devs are taking notes on this because i think this is is super important now asif in the doc you talked about learning a lot over the past few years and i'm sure amnesia mm -hmm. fortnite uh contributed a lot to that what are some of the key takeaways from your experience Oh, man. Uh, I mean, really, the biggest thing for me is working with a large group of people over multiple disciplines. Um, that's been like the biggest um, transition for me, because prior to this, I had just been working with my uh, two collaborators, and we've been working very closely together for a long time just about filmmaking. But now I know so much more about what everyone does at the studio. Like, it was one thing to sort of like look over their shoulder and see things on their monitor and have them explain. But now I have like a deeper understanding of how all of those disciplines and what everyone is contributing actually ties together and like where those connection points are. Um, so like that's that's a huge thing that like I can take with me and um, it always felt very felt very closed off uh, when I was first starting to do, do this. I just like I thought like I have no you know programming experience. I have no game design experience. I have no computer science background. Like there's no way I could ever possibly know how to do this and. I really think now, like, if I could go back and talk to myself uh, then, I would say that, like, you don't have to know all that stuff up front. Uh, you know, you have, like, a team of people that will help uh, fill on the gaps, and you will learn uh, over, the course of the, over the course of the job. And, you know, don't let that be the thing that stops you. I love that motivational part that you mentioned there. Now, um, you kind of talked about, you know, the fact that you didn't have much experience. And I think that's why this session right here is one of the most important, because I think maybe people who haven't gotten into game development are utilizing GameStack Live to, you know, figure out what they need to do and that motivation. And we saw in the documentary, you mentioned that, um, you know, when you were going up to go through the requirements of what you're going to need to start the, the Gods Must Be Hungry, you're like, I don't know what I need. I've never done this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so can you kind of uh, give us some some uh, background, some information for those looking to get started. Uh, what do they need? Oh, sorry. Well, sorry. I mean, in that specific context, it was more about like uh, what I needed as far as like team makeup goes. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah, I guess generally speaking, like just try and like pull together a team that has as many diverse skills as possible because you will all help each other fill in each other's gaps. Um, you know, you don't need to like necessarily find one person that knows how to do every single thing. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I love that. Now you mentioned how accessible Tim is as a studio head. Can you tell us again a little bit about what it means to be able to have someone who is the head of a studio that accessible? Has he given you any words of wisdom? <laughs> uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, uh, Tim is always good about um, imparting wisdom. I think the biggest thing, like it's, um, 
I feel like it's come through in a lot of the answers that I've given you today, honestly, like all that stuff about being receptive to other people's ideas and branching out and taking inspiration from different um, different forms of media. I think a lot of that comes from Tim, to be honest. Um, I couldn't necessarily pull a direct quote from him, but uh, I know that he is always referencing different kinds of media and different kinds of experiences when he talks about game ideas. And I think uh, that's where a lot of, you know, uh, I, I, I take, um, I don't know, my, I, I follow him. Yeah, and I, I think, um, again, not to reiterate my, my point earlier, but I think this has been one of the greatest sessions because it allowed you know, people to see that progression from documenting a studio's, you know, I guess, day to day to becoming a level designer and how that's all you need is someone to believe in you. All you need is someone to, to give you that um, you know, support and that allows you to kind of move on. Asif, thank you so much for joining us. This has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah, absolutely. Our, Absolutely. But before we check out this last, last, we're going to check out, before we move on, we're going to check out this quick word of wisdom from Tim Schafer. I was reading about Wong Kar Wai, the director who's making Ashes of Time, which is like a three-year epic production. I'm like, three years? That's no epic. That's basic game dev time. But uh, it was a really long production on location, and it was um, in China, and he was like, oh, everyone's, you know, we're so mired in this. Let's just take two weeks off and go to Hong Kong and bring some cameras and just improvise with actors and have fun and open it up. And he got the basis for uh, Chungking Express and Fallen Angels, I think, from those improv sessions. I just thought that was a really inspiring idea. Like, when you're in the middle of a game production, it can be a really heavy thing, just like you've been thinking about these characters and this world for so long. Just taking some time off to do something else can be really in, uh, creatively invigorating to, the, to everyone's brain. Our brains are funny because like just stuff gets stuck in the pipes. <laughs> like I think our brains have these pipes that easily uh, get gummed up and you like you have to like, kind of flush them out once in a while. You have to like get ideas out. That's why I believe in Things like uh, free writing. I do a lot of free writing on all these notebooks back here. I just fill them up. Like I, someone said, I look like that crazy person from Seven, the killer. I fill these notebooks up with just me talking to myself. And um, like we think about these things. We dream about crazy ideas. We sometimes write them down in private little journals. But like teaching people to share their creative work is an important part of it. Because that you do it, and, and unless you meet a really, you know, bad opposition, like your first person who you share a creative idea with laughs at you and <laughs> it can be bad. But as long as you get some support, you're like, and I, you know, I have another idea, I have another idea. You know, I would like to just uh, be an advocate of creativity uh, wherever I, where I am, because I think it's where the future is, where the next great, you know, game idea comes from. Like imitation is very common in the games industry because something's really popular, you should just, you know, and it does work out sometimes. But the, the big gangbuster titles are really like classics that people look at as really iconic were all weird ideas you know that just seemed crazy at the time that's where the next real big hit comes from is from some uh idea that sounds sounds weird the first time you say it and it maybe comes from someone in your company that you weren't looking to to make the next big uh, great game idea but they have it and they're sitting on it and it's sitting on a notebook and they won't share it until you push them out there and uh make them cough it up All right, we're making it through the day. Now we've talked about Gears, Forza, CFDs, and more over the last two days, but you know, we want you to know and also hear about another big franchise. Check out the talk from Josh Menke about matchmaking in Halo 5 and how it deepens player engagement. Then we'll be talking about xCloud directly with the team, but if you want to get more about the journey that the team has gone through, listen in with Eric Cohen on their learnings over the past year. And remember, we've got a metric ton more content on our YouTube playlist right now, and we'll make sure to have the panels featured in this live event up on our YouTube playlist soon. Now, we do have some responses coming in on Twitter, and we can get those thrown up on screen. We can read them out right now. This one from Andrew. Did not expect to be seeing Dave from Falling Squirrel on the GameStack live stream. What a way to say hello. <laughs> here we go, Ricari Shoes will steal the show. We're here to learn more about GameStack Live. Loved hearing about the Xbox Series X and Project Scarlet. The developers explaining their methodology on how they leverage the technology. Everyone is doing an awesome job. There's the shoes, look, I gotta say, I'm, I'm beholden to what was given to me with these. I merely just found something to make it work. I struggled to find something to make it work, either way. Do we have one more Twitter post that we could put up? That's it, that's it, all right. Well now it's time once again to catch up with the team over at The Coalition. 
But this time they're talking Gears Tactics. Take a look. They came for us, they invaded every part of our world. So we did the only thing we could. We set the world on fire. Now my war begins. Against the monster that created these monsters. Summon the beast! Crush them! And it's time to go hunting. That bridge is our way in. And they can't flank us. Don't go gentle. Bring it, shitheads. Close one! Enemy reinforcements. Find your own ride, asshole. Get out of squashing range! What my newest creation thinks of your little flag. Play it with Xbox Game Pass. Well, that just looked incredibly brutal. Joining us from the Coalition in Vancouver, Canada, please welcome Tyler Bielman and Mike Rayner. Guys, how are you doing? We're doing great. Oh, wow. And synchronization, too. Good to <laughs> know that we're on the same page here. Uh, first of all, how does Gears Tactics relate to the Gears franchise? Yeah, thanks for the opportunity to talk about the game. Uh, this came out of a an effort about four and a half years ago to really take a look at Gears of War as a as a brand and figure out could we take it new places, uh, can we find new audiences, and how can we really uh, showcase it for everyone. Uh, Gears Tactics uh, fits right in with the continuity of the Gears uh, franchise. It takes place in the same universe. Uh, the characters um, in the game are characters that relate to all the games you've played up to this point. So it really is just an extension of the brand and the incredible storytelling that we do in Gears of War just into a new kind of game. Well, I want to talk a little bit about that continuity. Where, does it take place during a certain, like, Gears 3 or 4 or 5? Is there a certain place yeah. that it takes place? Yeah, it, it takes place actually about a dozen years before the events of Gears of War 1. So we're talking about a time uh, when uh, just shortly after the emergence happens and the locusts spring up from underground and the response that the the coalition puts together and, and our heroes find themselves sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place uh, in that environment. Well, why did you choose that time? Did you guys want to showcase a little bit before about where Gears of War came from? Well, for us, uh, we had a lot of different options. You know, Gears of War has a long history and there's a lot of different points we could have set the game, but we did kind of want to revisit and throw back a little bit to the tone and the attitude of the original Gears of War game. So uh, this is really a story about, you know, characters on the road, soldiers in a bad situation that have to uh, pull together, band together and accomplish the impossible. So Gears of War, as we all know it, is a shooter. How have you guys made this game, Gears Tactics, fit into the shooter genre? Yeah, so it, it, this is not a shooter. So this is a, a turn-based tactics game. So uh, much like a game of checkers or chess, you will take a turn and the enemy will take a turn. And uh, it's very strategic. It's got a lot of depth to it. But uh, in converting uh, Gears into a turn-based experience, it was really important that we maintain the intensity 
the brutality, and a lot of what makes Gears special from a combat point of view. So when you play this game, uh, unlike a lot of other tactics games, um, this game is very open. We don't. The game is not played on a grid, for example. Uh, you have three actions per unit, so you're not constrained to just a move and a shoot. You can move with all three and shoot and use your special skills in different combinations. So bringing that openness to the game and that intensity to the game uh, really allowed us to make it feel like a Gears experience. Uh, we also paced up the experience so you get a lot more enemies per encounter than you might see in a traditional game. And uh, we brought one of our signature mechanics over from Gears Execution. So if you extend one of your units up and deliver an execution to a downed opponent, uh, you will actually get rewarded with bonus actions for your whole squad. Uh, and that allows you to build a lot of momentum. So in the same way Gears requires you to balance aggression and your use of cover, uh, we've really found that same special formula with Gears Tactics. I really do appreciate that you're bringing over elements from, from Gears of War over to Gears Tactics. Is there anything else that fans of Gears of War should look out for in Gears Tactics? Maybe an homage, something something that these fans, or may, you don't even have to answer that, it's supposed to be a secret. No, there's, there's, I mean, there's definitely things for for the Gears fan in there. A, lo a lot of it does have to do with the story, and we're we're being a little tight-lipped about certain elements of the story. But the main character is uh, Gabe Diaz. That is Kate Diaz's father. Kate being, of course, the main character from Gears of War Five. So, from a storytelling standpoint, there's a lot going on with him. We also have Ukon, our main villain. He is a geneticist. He's the monster who makes the monsters. So he's responsible for Brumox and Corpsers, who are the bosses you would have fought over and over in Gears of war and uh additionally mechanically we have all of our signature weapons we have our lancer chainsaw assault rifle we have the nasher shotgun um all of our enemies are most of the enemies sorry we do have a few special ones that we made just for this game but a lot of the enemies uh function in the same way you would have a boomer that's a big hulking threat with a grenade launcher it just works a little differently in tactics so if you're familiar with wretches and tickers and boomers and what they mean strategically in the gears of war franchise traditionally uh you'll see those appear here but there's just our twist on it to make it work in a turn-based way and it really helps boil down gears to its essential essence of how you use cover how you flank and how you sort of move aggressively forward uh, Mike, I want to know what you're excited about for players to get their hands on with Gears Tactics. Well, I think, you know, what's really important for uh, the PC gaming audience is to really have the most control over how the game performs on their system. So we've spent a lot of energy and effort in making sure that gamers have as much control as possible to tweak the game to their preference. To that effect, we have over 40 visual settings that players can tune to customize and optimize their PC gaming rig. Um, there's quite a few. You have control over things like the texture resolution and filter settings. You can control texture quality for characters, the world, and the visual effects all independently. There's control over the environment settings, so things like volumetric fog, which will color and add additional atmosphere to the game. You can control and enable planar reflections. We have glossy screen space reflections, which uses a compute-based ray-traced screen space reflection. <laughs> uh, and you can tune that quality um, and uh, you know, get the best effect uh, based on the performance of your, your PC rig. Uh, there's control for world detail, adding in more layers of visual details, and on the high end, adding more dynamic lights. Uh, all the lighting in the game is completely dynamic uh, to support uh, the fact that our worlds are made up of sort of procedural tile sets. So in your gameplay experience, you're never going to get quite the same gameplay run through as uh, you did the last time because we we vary that every time you play the game. There's control over shadow quality, shadow resolution. We have contact shadows. Uh, you know, really you know, a shadowing system that adds more uh, detail to all the dynamic objects in the game. Really, everything that you might want to be able to control that we've exposed so that gamers can tune it. Um, Post-processing effects, depth of field and cinematics and, and gameplay, uh, motion blur. Uh, you can turn it off. Some gamers don't like motion blur in their games. I know a and, few. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, for some people, they get motion sickness, so you can turn that off. Um, control over like the full post-processing chain, uh, bloom, lens flare, anti-aliasing quality. So 
we've really invested in the custom options and the settings. For each one of them, there's like low, medium, high, and ultra spec settings. So you can see uh, the visual effect of each one of those. And we provide some feedback on how much it costs, like how much CPU, how much GPU, how much VRAM it consumes. And then we have a benchmark uh, a benchmark mode in the game. So you can run the benchmark, see how your game performs, and then try different settings and really sort of tune and maximize uh, maximize for your, your custom rig. Um, I mean that's awesome. Uh, like yeah. we all want the, the you know yeah. the best high end computer out there. We can't all afford though these three thousand sure. four thousand dollar PCs. So being able to still play this game, fine tune uh, the the graphics and everything that you were just explaining it, so that everyone can have the opportunity to play this game without any hindrance is is incredible. And uh, I kind of want to lead into that uh, discussion with another question that from the trailer we saw that this game is launching on on PC only. What were the things that you focused on to make this a PC game first and foremost outside of those visual changes? Sure. Well, you know, we learned quite a bit uh, with Gears of War 5, which we shipped on PC as well. And there was a lot of work we did to optimize for PC and all of that we brought into the tactics engine. So we use DirectX 12, which allows us to run our rendering across uh, multiple cores, but it also lowers the CPU overhead of the graphics setup and graphics drawing pipeline. We have uh, multi-core scaling, so we can scale across the number of CPU cores you have. So our physics, our animation, our visual effects system uh, will all scale to uh, both down to like a dual core setup all the way up to, you know, however many cores you have. Uh, the AI processing in this game is quite, quite heavy. We, we we time slice that AI so that we process it over a number of seconds so it doesn't bog down your machine because it forward simulates the world and then picks the, a decent outcome to have the most sort of intelligent turn-based uh, you know, AI for the enemies you're playing against. Um, on the GPU, we have asynchronous compute, tiled resources, uh, and of course, all those settings to let you sort of scale down to support lower end systems. Now. We did all this work for Gears 5, but then for Tactics, we knew we wanted to go even broader. We wanted to support laptops. We wanted to support um, you know, PCs that may not have discrete graphics cards. So we really optimized for single core performance, uh, all the way down to dual core machines. Uh, we did work to support embedded GPUs and APUs. Uh, so you know, like I said, PCs that don't have discrete graphics cards. Uh, we're supporting some new features like variable rate shading, uh, which will allow us to really ensure that we're processing uh, the shading against the pixels that will need it the most. And then we also have content scaling. So the material complexity, detail objects, and shadows, we tag those in our art process so that as we scale down to support a broader set of PCs, we can also adjust our content, not just the, uh, the graphics and CPU work. Now, one thing that, that we've added um, that we've done in previous titles as well, but I think it's really important, is we have an auto detection of your hardware. So when you first run the game, we'll detect your, your hardware, your CPU, your GPU, how much VRAM you have, and we'll choose defaults that will, uh, default settings that will ensure you have both the best kind of visual setup and the best performing game. So like right out of the gate, you will get the best experience possible. But then of course you can go in and dial and tune it uh, based on your preferences. That is awesome. Uh, Mike and Tyler, thank you guys so much for sharing that. Gears Tactics looks amazing, and it's going to be launching on Steam, Windows 10, and Xbox Game Pass for the PC on April 28th. Now I'm going to be walking over and joining Malik and Rikari for what I think is the last time. How's it going? For now. Yeah, I'm going to cry. For now. Oh, you're going to cry? I'm gonna cry? No, I'm not going to cry. Okay, good. I don't, have, I don't have tears. Um. The show may be over, everyone, but for many of you, Discovery has just begun. Guys, what did you think of the last two days? Rakari? Kind of fun. I mean, I said the word a whole bunch of times. Uh, what a way to pivot in such a small amount of time, and what a production it became. Yeah. Seriously? And what a chance to connect with a ton of people that we otherwise wouldn't have seen. That's right. That's right. I mean, I would agree. Uh, I would say um, just the... Um, the content for developers who are looking to start making games or who are already like veterans, and we kind of set that up at the beginning of the first day, um, the wealth of knowledge that was shared over the past few days, I think GameStack 1 is going to be a great tool, set of tools, but then also um, just, you know, there's so much knowledge, and it's been great to see that, that shared.
What about you, Kelly? Man, I mean, it's all been amazing. And like you guys were saying, just being able to talk to people, learn so much from them. But I'm actually a little sad. I wasn't aware that Brutal Legend 2 was supposed to be a thing and didn't become oh. this week. Yeah. So I'm a little bummed. I'm also bummed that this is ending because this has been a great experience. Just like you guys were saying, though, I mean, shout outs to, to our crew, the production, everyone that put this together in such a short amount of time. We're just here speaking the words. It's really all of them that made this happen, guys. So, I mean, and obviously to the people in Discord chatting 100%. and letting us know mm -hmm. their opinions and asking questions, too. It's been a great experience overall. Absolutely. So everyone, make sure to check out our YouTube playlist for all the resources you need to take your game development to the next level with GameStack. And don't forget to keep up with us on all the socials. Keep the conversation going, everyone. We love to hear from you. Don't laugh, Rikari. <laughs> Plus, while GDC may be canceled, but the Independent Games Festival and Game Developers Choice Awards will be streaming live today. Oh, wow. I didn't realize that was today, but that's awesome. 8 p.m. ET, 5 p.m. PT. You can head on over to GDConf, that's C-O-N-F dot com, for more details. Now, for DirectX fans, listen up. The Microsoft DirectX team is hosting the first Mixer DirectX Developer Day streaming live tomorrow. That's Thursday, March 19th at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific. They'll be talking about the next major evolution of DirectX and detailing how developers can use all of the latest technology to make incredible games. Hardware partners will also be joining them to talk about the new technology and their hardware. Plus, engineers will be online all day to answer questions on Mixer and in Discord. So head on over to Mixer.com slash DirectX tomorrow. That's right. And remember, GameStack was created to help you create the next great title. So whether you're a new developer or a seasoned pro, game, seasoned pro GameStack solution can get you where you want to go. Until next time, we'll see you around. Thank you for joining GameStack Live. I hope this content opened up new ideas and will get you closer to your goals. Over these two days, you've learned how our open ecosystem approach with GameStack can help you better build, distribute, and operate your games. We've shown how you can bring all the tools you love to GameStack and make your experience even better. Our first party studios and ID at Xbox program participants provided behind the scenes looks into their development process. Continue the conversation online. Please share your feedback. We can't wait to see what you will create. Terraflop Beast. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Sorry. We heard it already. The Xbox Series X. As they're pressing button inputs on the gamepad, but I can kind of react to that feedback on the fly and just make funky parties and make funky choices and just test out the game for fun. This looks awesome. Empowering game creators to realize their dreams. He stole my answer. I was All right, I'm back in my corner, right where I belong. Well, what an outro you threw right there. Oh, Way to yeah. make people feel welcome. Way to make yeah. us feel welcome too. And of yes, course. we do play. Awesome, thanks Chief. I'll take it from here. Xbox Series X. Thank you. How do I get players access to the right thing at the right time, at the right moment? Okay. And did Ricari pay to get his tweet up here? I think Unbelievable. so. Unbelievable. Yeah, I heard him talking a little bit back in the production. But Ricari's shoes will steal the show. We're here to learn more about GameStack Live. Awesome job. There's the shoes. Look, I gotta say, I'm, I'm beholden to what was given to me with these. Every single step of the way. Ding. <laughs> you sold it. <laughs> oh.